Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's hearing. Today we're going to hear evidence from Lord Barwell, who at one time was a junior minister in the Department for Communities and Local Government. Yes, Ms. Grange. Yes, could we have Lord Barwell, please? Good morning, Lord Barwell. I understand you're going to affirm. Yes. Well, the words should be there in front of you on the screen. Would you read them out, please? I do solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Would you care to sit down and make yourself comfortable, please? All right. Yes. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Grange. Yes, thank you. Yes, Lord Barwell. Can I just start by thanking you very much for attending this public inquiry today to give your evidence? It's very much appreciated. If you have any difficulty understanding any of the questions that I'm going to ask you, please just say so and I'll either repeat the question or I'll put the point in a different way. Um, and the other thing I'd ask you to do is keep your <coughs> voice up and keep your voice not too fast so that the transcriber who's sitting to your right can take a nice clean note of your evidence. Now, you've provided the inquiry with two witness statements. The first is at CLG 3030960. There we have it. And if we look on page 15, we can see it's dated the 22nd of April. And is that your signature there? Uh, my electronic one, yes. Thank you. And have you read that witness statement recently? I have. And are the contents of it true? They are. Thank you. And you also made a second witness statement for the inquiry. That's at CLG 3034283. There we have that on the screen. Now, I understand you've got a clarification to make to paragraph 19 on page 8 of that. Is that right? We could just go to page 8. Yes. yes. So I'm, I'm happy that the, the answer is correct, but I think I could have provided a more helpful and a bit more detail to the answer, so I thought it might help you with your questions to say this at the outset. Yes. So I say here that my knowledge and understanding of the review and what it was to encompass developed over time. I then leap right to the end, uh, to, to March of 2018, and I think I could have inserted a couple of sentences there referencing the initial submission that I suspect you're going to ask me about that came in September 2016. Yes. Uh, and then the speech I gave to the local authority building control uh, conference. Uh, right. So there's probably just a couple of things I could have added there to explain that context of how that understanding developed over time. That's very helpful. Thank you very much. Now, if we look at page 13 of uh, this statement... There we can see it's dated the 5th of July 2021. And again, is that your electronic signature? It is. And subject to the additions that you've just gone through, um, is that, that statement true? Yes. Thank you very much. And have you discussed the evidence you're going to give today with anyone before coming here? No, I am. Um, uh, as I think she alluded to in her own evidence to you, Melanie Dawes and I had a discussion well before uh, I'd even been asked to give evidence, but in terms of the two statements and what I'm going to say today, no. Thank you. Now, I just want to start by asking you some questions about your background. Now, first of all, what qualifications do you hold? So I don't have any professional qualifications, just edu educational ones and uh, yes, an undergraduate what, degree. Yes, what was your degree in? Uh, it was in natural sciences. Uh, physics was the, was the main area of speciality. And then if we go to paragraph two of your first witness statement, you tell us there that you were the Member of Parliament for Central Croydon between May 2010 and June 2017, is that correct? That's correct, yes. And just briefly, what was your career history before you were an MP? So I had, I had worked essentially in politics. I did a sort of traditional post-university job as a researcher for the Conservative Party. Uh, I became a, a special advisor in, in what was effectively the predecessor department to CLG, what was then known as the Department of the Environment. And I then moved over into working for the Conservative Party, not on policy, but on, uh, on winning elections and ending up being uh, the chief operating officer, effectively, of the party. Uh, so running it as an organisation. Uh, yes. And then was elected to Parliament in, in May 2010, as I yes. say in the statement here. Yes, thank you. So, and is it right that you, so you worked at Conservative Party headquarters from 1993 until your election as an MP in 2010, yes? I, I had a brief period where I was a sort of consultant, not working in central office, but it was still working in politics. So effectively what you've said is, is as, as a, as a simplisation, it's true, yeah. Yes, thanks. 
and um, you were the Conservative Party's Chief Operating Officer between 2003 and 2006, yes, is that correct? that's correct. And so we know that in July 2016, you became the Junior Minister of State for Housing and Planning in the Ministry for Housing, Communities and Local Government, which we know as MHCLG. We'll be referring to that department here and after as the department, just to be clear. Now, and in that role, you were part of Theresa May's first ministry, yes? Correct. Thank you. Let's look at an organogram, which is very helpful on this. It's at CLG 30019462. This is an organogram that's helpfully been provided to the inquiry that shows uh, the department, starting with the Secretary of State at the very top, and then moving down into the respective ministers, the permanent secretary, and then various directors at the bottom. And I want to focus with you. It's the top right-hand corner where we see your name. And what we can see from this, looking two or three lines down, in the second line down and the third line down, is that you took over from Brandon Lewis as the minister with responsibilities for housing in July 16, yes? Correct. And you also took over from James Wharton as the Minister with Responsibilities for Building Regulations. Do you see that? That's correct, although I wasn't so clear about that at the moment of my appointment, but it became clear when I had a, con I had a handover conversation with Brandon. Right, I see, yes. And that's why we see your name in two of the boxes, and then you were succeeded by Alok Sharma in both of those roles thereafter, yes? I believe so, yes. Yes, thanks. And we can see that you reported to Sajid Javid as the Secretary of State for Communities and Local Government at the time. Do you see that there? Yes, we were both appointed uh, in the same reshuffle. Yes, thank you. And you served until the general election on the 8th of June 2017 when you lost your seat, yes? That's true, yes. Sorry. Um, and is it right that you were also Minister for London between July 16 and June 17? I can't remember if the Minister for London appointment happened at the same time as the Minister for Housing appointment or whether it came subsequently, but it's certainly true that for a significant chunk of that period, I was Minister for London as well as Minister for Housing, yes. Right, thank you. And then uh, on the 10th of June 2017, you were then appointed Downing Street Chief of Staff and you held that post until July 2019 following the departure of Theresa May as Prime Minister, yes? That's correct. And you were made a life peer in October 2019, yes? Uh, yeah, I don't know the date, but uh, sh shortly after my departure from number 10, yes. Thank you. Now, during your tenure as Minister of State for Housing, the Permanent Secretary was Melanie Dawes, that's right? That's it? correct. And if we look at uh, paragraph 8 of your first witness statement on page 2... You tell us there that you were supported by a director general and a team of senior directors within the department, as well as my ministerial private office. And you tell us that the director general post was vacant when you joined and was then filled by Helen McNamara. Yes? That's correct, yes. I think it, I think it, you, it was on the previous spreadsheet, but I think it was Peter Schofield had had that job and he'd just been appointed as the permanent secretary, I think, at DWP. So the, the post was vacant when I came into office and then Helen was appointed a couple of months later, I think. Yes, that's right. Let, let's go back to the organogram because it's very helpful to be able to see the timeline. Yeah. So um, we can see uh, it's one, two, three, four, five lines down that Helen McNamara just comes in in September 2016, shortly after your appointment in July 2016. And as you say, she replaced Peter Schofield. Yes. And we can also see from that organogram that the director with responsibility for the building regulations during your time was Steve Quartermain. That's right, yes. He's so been in there from April 2016 and he was there until, like yourself, June 2017. Yes. Yeah? And he had a wider responsibility for the planning system, but building regulations is part of that, yes. Yes, thank you. And also, throughout your tenor, tenor, tenure, we see at the very bottom of that uh, organogram uh, that Bob Ledson was the deputy director with responsibility for the building regulations. So I wouldn't have known that his uh, rank, as it were, grade was deputy director, but I said, if you'd asked me who was the official who was leading under Steve on building regulations, I would have said Bob Ledson, yes. Great, that's helpful, thank you.
Now, in paragraph eight of your first statement, we were just looking at it. We don't need to go back to it. You tell us that <coughs> you didn't have a special advisor, but you work closely with the Secretary of State's special advisors. Is that right? Yes. Uh, so the, the general protocol is that ministers who are either cabinet ministers or who attend cabinet have their own special advisors. But if you're a minister of state who doesn't attend cabinet, then you don't have your own special advisors and you work with the relevant Secretary of State special advisors. Yes, thank you. And the special advisors to the Secretary of State which you worked with, you tell us, I think, in your second statement, were Nick King, Salma Shah, and later Carrie Simons, yes? That's correct. Yeah. Just help us, what is the role of a special advisor, or a shortened to a SPAD, as briefly as you can? How, how would you describe that role? So they're there to provide party political advice to their Secretary of State. They normally come, I would say, in, in two variants. There are some who specialise on policy work. Uh, so Nick would very much have been in that category. And there are others who support their Secretary of State in terms of their communications. Right. Uh, and so Salma and then Carrie, uh, when she came in, would have been more in that category. There's Sometimes they will overlap a bit um, because obviously it's very difficult to do the communications job unless you understand the policy context. But those are the, those are the two main types, I would say. Certainly if you're talking about special advisors in uh, lead departments rather than in number 10, where there's a, there's a larger number and, and a wider variety of roles. Yes, thank you. Now, did any of those special advisors have any specific interest or expertise in building regulation matters? So they certainly wouldn't have had specific expertise um, because their, their background was essentially as, was as political yeah. experts. Uh, in terms of interest, I wouldn't say particularly. Uh, I think I say in my witness statement that Nick had a particular interest in leasehold reform. And that was Nick King. Nick yes. King, yes. That was yeah. the main issue that I remember him focusing on from a policy point of view but they would have uh, there's definitely in the in the documents uh, that have been supplied to the inquiry uh, I, I don't have them in front of me but there's definitely one minute where I've approved something and my private secretary is saying the political advisors will need to approve this too before it's published so yeah. they would have had a role but if your question was did they have any sort of specific interest in in that issue I wouldn't say that they did yeah or well, what about fire safety did any of them have any particular interest in fire safety or indeed any expertise in no it? so I think as I said Nick was the policy specialist and if you were asking me which issue did he have a particular passion for it would have been leasehold reform yeah now, if we look at paragraph three on page two of your witness statement, you also tell us that you work closely with a chap called Tim Lunig. Um, you want this up on the screen, Miss Grange? Uh, yes, we can have it Come up on. there. Yeah, I've got it. I've got it. Thank you. So you tell us <coughs> in the very last sentence there, in the interest of openness, I also work closely with Tim Lunig. Is that the way to pronounce Lo it? I think it's Luinig. Luinig. I think. Thank you. <laughs> uh, who was a policy advisor to the Secretary of State, not a special advisor. Now, just help us briefly with this. Can you just explain the difference between a special advisor and a policy advisor to the Secretary of State? So I think the explanation would be that he was employed as a civil servant, not as a special advisor, but on a limited term contract, whereas most civil servants would be on, would be permanent members of the payroll. Uh, and so Tim provided very wide ranging uh, policy advice, both to the Secretary of State and myself. He's, uh, I think he's currently working at the Treasury, but he's an incredibly intelligent man who, who provides really useful challenge. Uh, so he's one of these people that generates lots of ideas uh, you wouldn't adopt them all, but it was it was all he was one of these people that was invaluable at always at always providing an alternative perspective and challenging orthodox thinking. Yeah, uh, and I valued his input very very highly, as I think did the Secretary of State. Yeah, and did he have any particular background or interest in building regulations or fire safety matters? No, I, I would say his main focus, probably reflecting what I say in my witness statement in terms of my focus and, and the Secretary of State's focus on housing, was on the housing supply crisis. That was the issue the Prime Minister had charged us with trying to address. So most of the interaction I had with him was on that issue. Yes, thank you. Now, if we look now at paragraph seven on page two of your first statement. So... Yep. Yes, thank you. You give us an explanation here of, of your the breadth of your portfolio as Minister of State for Housing. And you tell us, you, you say there that it included housing supply policy, home ownership policy, planning policy, 
planning casework oversight, homes and community, communities agency sponsorship, estates regeneration, the Thames Gateway, building regulations, private rented sector regulation and the neighbourhood planning bill. Yes? Yes. Uh, so I think that has probably been lifted from a departmental website or press release. I think that was the, the original description that the department gave of my portfolio. Yes. And should we add anything else to that portfolio? For example, we talked about you being Minister for London. Was that also part of your portfolio? So that was a sort of separate role. So I think the way I've described it here is that was my portfolio as Minister of State for Housing, whereas Minister for State for London was a job, if you like, that was trying to work not just within the department but across government, coordinating the work that different ministers were, were doing and liaising with the Mayor of London and trying to ensure that there was a better relationship between the government uh, and the Mayor. So that's probably why that's been, that's been left off that description. Yes, and just in general terms, what proportion of your time was spent doing housing matters versus London matters? 90, 95% housing, 5 yeah. to 10% London. Right, thank you. Now, how did you ensure that you were able to provide leadership across these substantial and varying work streams that are described here? That's a, that's a difficult question to answer, and mainly by hard work, by trying to read as much. Um, it, it may be useful context for the inquiry. Mm -hmm. This role, combining housing policy and planning, uh, it was a huge amount of incoming paper every day into the office because you didn't only have the policy submissions, which I'm sure you're going to come on and ask about, and correspondence, but there was a huge volume of planning casework where the minister, unlike most decisions that a minister takes that are, that are policy decisions, you were taking quasi-judicial decisions uh, about where, where applications had been referred up to the Secretary of State or whether to intervene in a local authority's development of its local plan. So just one of those decisions might have a bundle of papers about that thick uh, that was coming in. So there was a huge volume of work. Uh, and obviously, ministers are not technical experts. They're not policy specialists. I was, I was probably relatively lucky in that I was appointed to a job that I had some familiarity with because I'd been a local councillor and I'd been a special advisor in this department a number of years before. But mainly, I tried by a huge amount of reading to get on top of as much of that policy detail as possible in order that I could provide the political leadership that, that was my role. Yes, and where you, where you say there that you'd been a special advisor in this department a number of years before, um, when was that? That was between 1995 and 1997. So David Curry was the Minister for Housing and Local Government, and I advised him across those two portfolio areas. Yes. And did you have any dealings at all as, as when you were that special advisor in building regulation matters, building control matters? I don't recall it being, I, I'm sure I will have had some involvement, but I don't recall it being, there was a, there were the main piece of work on housing at that time was, I think it was the Housing Act 1996. Yeah. But forgive me, I haven't no. prepped that period before coming here today, and that really is a long time ago. Yeah. But I think that was the, the main focus <coughs> on this piece of legislation uh, that the department was taking through Parliament at that time. Yes. Now, as we've seen from the organogram, you took over in part from Brandon Lewis, who'd been the Minister of State for Housing and Planning before you. Now, if we just look at his witness statement, if we could go to CLG 30311121, and I want to look at page four, paragraph 12. So, um, he, if we pick it up four lines down... Uh, in the middle, there's a, a, a sentence beginning, the central theme. Yes. And he says, the central theme of my brief was to introduce policies and ideas to enable more houses to be built. For this reason, at the suggestion of the Secretary of State and Sheridan Westlake, I did not have responsibility for the building regulations, as it was thought that it would be counterproductive to have those differing responsibilities in one ministerial portfolio. Now, um, were you aware of that, that there'd been a conscious decision that Brandon Lewis would not have the building regulations as part of his portfolio because it was thought counterproductive, given that he also had housing and planning? So I had a handover meeting with Brandon shortly after I was appointed, and it was at that point that I realised that we, there was this difference in our responsibilities. Our job titles were the same, but it wasn't an exact mirroring. I wasn't aware, uh, if you like, that there was, a, there was a rationale 
behind that difference. What tends to happen is that when the Prime Minister appoints you to a junior ministerial job, you get given the overall job title, Minister for Housing, say, and then the Secretary of State will divide, if you go back to the, the previous paragraph you had where you had that list of eight or nine things that I was responsible for, yeah. the Secretary of State will do that kind of subdivision. Yeah. So I presumed that the difference was purely because to balance out the work between the ministers in the previous iteration of the department. I, it's difficult not being able to talk to Brandon and understand what that sentence means, but I find it slightly surprising. Right. Because if it's suggesting some kind of tension mm. between having building more homes and the building regulations in the same portfolio, I personally don't agree with that for two reasons. One is there's clearly, there's clearly a link between getting the regulations right in terms of supply. But secondly, one of the things that the Secretary of State and I were very passionate about was that the debate was sometimes too focused purely on numbers of homes you were being built and quality was also an important consideration and clearly the regulations are critical in terms of the, the safety, the access standards, the environmental performance of the homes that we build in this country. So it's difficult for me to answer your question because Brandon isn't here to give me the yeah. other point of view, but I find that sentence slightly surprising. Okay. Did you yourself ever have any discussions with others, perhaps including the Secretary of State, about whether you should in fact have responsibility for housing planning and housing supply policy, as well as the building regulations. Was that ever discussed at all? No, the, the, I, I was given the portfolio I was given and there wasn't any um, review at any point, as it were. And were you ever aware of any, any potential? I, I appreciate you've said you didn't think it was a problem and you've given those reasons. Were you ever aware of any potential conflict between having both of those as part of your portfolio? No, I didn't feel that there was a conflict uh, the challenge I had was was the volume of the work, the breadth of the portfolio. But I didn't, if you're asking me, did I feel that there was some uh, intrinsic problem with having those two things within my portfolio? No, I didn't feel that. Yeah. Looking back on it now, do you think you were able to give all of these areas the attention that they really needed and deserved during this time? So I might just try and clarify what you mean by the question. So I, I definitely felt at the time that I was able to do that. Yeah. Knowing what I know now with hindsight, you know, clearly I, well, I'm sure we'll come on to this, but the, uh, the briefing that I was given initially by Bob Bledsoe about the building regulations, uh, I think gave an impression that the system was working far better than we now know it actually was. Yes. And therefore, in that first few months in the job, I didn't give that area of the portfolio the same priority as the housing supply questions because the Prime Minister had, uh, had asked me to focus on that critical issue. So if you're asking me, knowing what I know now, do I think I gave enough attention to the building regulations issues in those first few months? No, I don't. But if you're asking me, did I, if you'd asked me when I left the job in June of 2016, did I feel I'd been able to cope with the breadth of what I had? I would have said just about. I mean, I was, I was coming in very early and I was working till very late, yeah. but I felt, and I, I hope, you'll have obviously taken evidence from some of the officials I worked with, I hope that they would feel that I was a very conscientious minister that, that tried to mm. deal with the volume of work that, that was coming onto my desk. Yeah, but it sounds from your answer, is this fair, that by the end of your time in the department, so let's take the last few months of 20 you know, where you were there in 2017, so February, March, April 2017, it sounds like maybe you were feeling like the portfolio was, was rather large and difficult to keep on top of. Is that fair? Rather large is fair. Unmanageable would not be fair. OK. Um, I think it was manageable, but it, were, it was demanding. We, we had one fewer junior ministers in the department than at some previous periods they had had. Uh, and I think I am right in saying that I was the only... Minister of State. So for, for the inquiry's benefit, there are, there are two gradations of junior minister, ministers of state and parliamentary undersecretaries of state. And I was the only minister of state. So it meant that not only did I have the portfolio that you've asked me about in your questions, but if the Secretary of State was absent, for example, I was the person that would, that would deputise for him. Yeah. Um, so uh, definitely fair if you're saying to me, was it, was it a rather large portfolio that was demanding? Yes. 
I, I wouldn't have said it was unmanageable. OK, thank you. Now, can we agree that your function uh, as minister were included acting as decision maker on any issue concerning the building regulations? It would, it would depend upon uh, the scale of the decision. Uh, there would be some decisions that would just be taken by me as Minister of State, but there would be some issues, uh, if they were significant, that would go to me first and then to the Secretary of State. So right. you'll come on, I'm sure, to ask me about the two submissions in September 2016 and March 2017 about the discussion document. Yes. Both of them, if, if you look at them, both are addressed... Gavin Barwell, and Secretary of State, yes. one, two. Yes. So some things go on, some things are more minor decisions that just come to you as, as the junior <coughs> minister. Yes, but inherent in the function that you had was the obligation to challenge or question the advice of officials, yes? Yes, uh, and I think I, I've seen this asked of previous witnesses, so it may be helpful if I just explain a little bit about how I saw that role. Yes, briefly, yes. Um, so um, a minister whose default setting is not to believe anything that the officials say to them, that's not going to make for a happy working relationship. So I think what you mean when you ask me that question is my job was to provide some political judgment over the official advice and some intellectual challenge to what uh, the department was proposing to do. Yes. And the way that I tended to do that was to look uh, for other sources of information. So if the department was telling me X were the opposition or some newspapers or the select committee or backbench MPs telling me the opposite and giving me reason to think that maybe what I'm being told by the officials isn't right. So that's how I approached that, that question. But I, if you're saying to me my job was to provide a degree of intellectual challenge, I agree. Yes, thank you. Now, how frequently would you meet with Helen McNamara, the Director General? My... So I, I'm tr I will try when I answer your questions to tell you where I'm certain and where I'm sort of making a best estimate. And so this is definitely in the best estimate category. Mm. I think, and the department may be able to confirm this in writing afterwards, I think there was a Monday housing and planning catch-up, which Helen and, the, and all her directors would come to. So yeah. we had a scheduled regularly, regular weekly meeting. But there might be a number of other meetings during the week that she would choose to attend where some of her team were coming to me about specific policy submissions. Yes, I follow. And I would also probably see her once a week. There was a sort of meeting between all ministers and the most senior officials in the department, which I think from memory was on a Wednesday. So there'll be two formal meetings where I would expect to see her every week, but there might be other meetings that she would choose to attend. Yes. Now, what about the director with responsibility for building regulations? As we know, that was Steve Quatermain. Would he come to those Monday meetings? Yes. yes. Uh, and I would also have fairly regular meetings with Steve. Mm. So I, uh, you, uh, you've correctly identified that he was the director responsible for building regulations. Yes. But he was also responsible for all of the planning casework. Yes. So if, if the department were taking planning decisions or intervening in the plan making process of a local authority. Yes. And... There was a significant volume of that work. I think it would be fair to say that the department struggled to deliver that work within the timescales required, given the resourcing it had. And so he and I would talk regularly about managing that work because what he didn't want was me, if he was near a deadline on a decision when it came to me, he wanted me to take a quick decision so that they didn't, they, they met the target for the percentage that were being taken in time. Yeah. So I would say Steve was one of the officials I dealt with most regularly, both in a formal setting, him at meetings talking about policy things, but also helping me working together to try and make sure we got through yeah. this huge volume of work uh, against the targets that we were setting ourselves. Yes, and, and what work was it that the department was struggling to deliver in the timescales? So this was, so there, I can't remember the exact target, but there was, a, there was a target to determine a certain percentage of the planning applications that we had called in within a certain timescale. Yes. Uh, and the officials would have to do a huge amount of work to produce these huge bundles of paper, analysing the application and providing advice to me they were obviously very important decisions because they were quasi-judicial in nature, and then I would have to consider these submissions. Sometimes it would be clear to me what the right decision was. Sometimes you'd want a meeting to probe the advice that you'd been uh, received. So this was not policy work. It was this, this quasi-judicial work on, in terms of the planning decisions yes. that Steve and I would regularly have discussions about um, 
which ones to prioritise at any point in time. Yes. And looking back, what proportion of your time was actually spent discussing building regulations type matters with Steve Quartermain as opposed to the planning casework? Uh, so the planning casework was fairly constant throughout the entire period. As you can imagine, there's just a there's a constant pipeline, essentially, of decisions that are coming your way. So yep. that was fairly constant throughout the uh, 10 months or so that I was in the job. Yeah. In terms of the building regulations, uh, I would say uh, it increased over time. Right. Um, you'll, uh, I'm sure you'll have seen Steve's written uh, submission. I don't think he's given all evidence, but he gave a written evidence to, to the inquiry. Uh, and he says there that there was an occasion where he had to prompt me um, because there were some submissions on, I think it was on research that needed publishing. Uh, so this was exactly the kind of conversation we'd have on the planning where he'd just say to me, look, these have been in your intro for a bit. They're, they're important. Please, could you look at them? And, and I then dealt with them straight away. Okay. So initially, there was, there was the initial briefing with Bob Ledson. There were some submissions relating to research work <coughs> with this first draft of the discussion document. And then really we had a period where the prioritisation was very heavily on the white paper, the housing yes. white paper. Yes. And then after that, uh, we come back and we start thinking about taking the discussion document forward. So I would say it varied on building regulations during the period, yes. whereas the planning was more constant throughout. Yes. Uh, and look, look, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. Look, Barbara, I, I hope you'll forgive me, but I'm going to ask you to see if you can slow down a little bit because a, a stenographer who's excellent does sometimes find it difficult to keep up. You're not the only witness who you asked that of. Uh, yeah. I, I promised before I would try and speak well, more slowly, see but what I will, you can I will do anyway. redouble my efforts. Thank you very much. <clears throat> yes, thank you. And, and how often did you meet with Bob Ledsom? Uh, well, we, we know he was the deputy director with responsibility for building regulations. You've said he was the go-to person if you were speaking about building regulations. How often would you see him and speak to him about building regulations matters? So Bob would be less frequent than Steve because Steve would have been coming both to the Monday catch-up with Helen and her directors and he would have been coming to meetings with me both about building regulations and about planning, whereas Bob would tended to have only come either if there were building regulations briefing or submissions, or if I were answering uh, a parliamentary question yes. uh, that related to building regulations, or if there was a piece of correspondence we wanted to discuss. So I would see him fairly regularly, but not as regularly as Steve Quartermain. Right, thank you. Do you ever recall meeting with Brian Martin, who was the technical policy lead on fire safety within the department? I would be amazed if I didn't, but I don't, I can't recall a specific meeting that I know he was at. Yeah. Did you know about the work of the technical policy leads within the department? Did, did you know that they existed and did you know broadly what work they did? No. I, if you're saying to me there was a distinction between policy officials and technical policy experts, I wasn't aware of that discussion, that, that distinction. At the time I was a minister, I've seen discussion of it in the inquiries. Uh, yeah. deliberations. Yeah. And was there a formal handover process uh, that start with between you and, and Mr Lewis? Was there any formal handover there? I think formal would be uh, putting something too strong on it. Generally, in my experience in politics, it doesn't happen, and it should. Uh, so Brandon and I arranged it ourselves. He, uh, if memory serves, he had been appointed as a Minister of State in the Home Office, and the Home Office and CLG at that point shared a building. So I think we arranged that I just went round to his private office uh, and we sort of did a handover between ourselves. Mm. And do you remember any discussion at that point about building regulations matters or fire safety? Uh, so yes, but only in the sense that that was the point when I realised that my portfolio didn't exactly mirror Brandon's. Right, I see. And can you remember what he said to you about building regulations or fire safety matters? I think he, I think he literally said, I wasn't responsible for that. Yeah. And then James Wharton, who was responsible for that, did you have any kind of handover with him? I didn't, and I should have. Right. Did you ever speak to him at all? No. No. Not that I can, not that I can recall. Um, and I think it's probably a reflection of two things. Uh, I was personally closer to Brandon, knew, knew him better. And then I think by the time I'd had the meeting with Brandon, I was sort of into the job, having the introductory briefing, so it didn't feel as urgent as the conversation with Brandon did. But I should have done so. Yes. 
Now, just some questions now about your knowledge and understanding of the building regulations and the approved documents. Did you have any particular knowledge of the building regulations when you joined the department? You said you served as a councillor before. Had you ever had to deal with the building regulations before? I, I knew what they were. I knew what the local authority building control service was. I didn't have any technical expertise in them at all, but I was familiar with what building control was. Yeah. But that, it went, that was as far as it, as went. Far as it went. To what extent during your time as minister did you become familiar with the building regulations and the system for building control in England and Wales? Did you feel like you, you gained a familiarity of that? Yes, yeah, so this sort of touches on the clarification I provided to my second witness statement uh, yeah. at the start of uh, these proceedings. So uh, I think it's been shared with the inquiry, but I had an initial briefing led by Bob Ledsom. I'm coming to that in a moment. So that, I suppose, was the starting point for getting my knowledge up to, uh, to a certain level. So I'll, I'll leave that if you're coming to it. Yes. Uh, and then, obviously, there were a number of submissions in that sort of early autumn period before the housing white paper became the dominant focus. And then once the white paper was done early in the new year... Uh, there were some more submissions. There was a speech that I referred to uh, to the local authority building control conference. And that I found very useful because I spent a day, I think it was Richard Harrell was the official um, who, who went with me to that conference. So I got to spend a whole day with someone that I hadn't known that well until then and focused in on this issue. And then obviously towards the end of my time before the election was called, uh, we had the submission on the final version of the discussion document. Yes. And finally, the other thing I think was probably worth mentioning uh, was a number of engagements with Parliament that, that touched on the building regulations in one way, uh, shape or form. So I would say an initial quick increase in my knowledge from that initial briefing, then grew a bit during the autumn, then kind of a pause and then came back to it after the white paper. Right. Well, let's look at what you did know. Um, did you know that the statutory scheme involved the imposition of overarching functional or performance requirements? Did you know that? Yes. And what did you understand the overarching aim of those functional requirements to be? Um, there, there's a number of aims of the different bits of the building regulation. So clearly in relation to fire safety to protect life. Um, but you've also got access to buildings, you've got the energy performance of buildings, you've got electrical safety. So they're, they're trying to ensure that buildings are safe, energy efficient, secure places. They're trying to do it in a way which is not prescriptive. So I think I'm right in saying the original version of the building regulations back in the 1960s was prescriptive about exactly what construction techniques should be used and the documents came to therefore be very long. And there was a change, I think, in the mid-1980s uh, to, to a much shorter set of requirements that were functional, as you describe, backed up by the, the statutory guidance in the form of the approved documents. Yes. So did you know that those approved documents were for the purpose of providing practical guidance on how to meet those functional performance requirements? Yes, that was, I think if we, we'll, we'll come on to it, but that was clearly explained, I think, in the initial briefing yep. uh, by Bob Lidson. Yeah. Did you know anything about the status of those approved documents in terms of what compliance or non-compliance with them might mean? My, my memory is that... Uh, following the approved document did not necessarily guarantee compliance and that there were ways of complying without having to do exactly what was set out in the approved. So the responsibility was on, ultimately on the developer to, to comply with the requirements, but that they were guidance about ways in, in which that might be gone about. Yes. Did you know that in civil or criminal proceedings there might be a presumption in favour of compliance if you had followed the approved document and a presumption the other way if you hadn't? Did you know about that? So I probably wouldn't have been able to phrase it as precisely as you just have, but that would have been the sense that was what I was just trying to communicate to you. Yes, that I understand. If you, if, you'd, if you followed the guidance, you had a good chance of being able to demonstrate compliance, but it wasn't guaranteed. Yes. Did you ever have to come to read any of the approved documents? Uh, I didn't read any of the approved documents. I suspect that would have happened um, had I stayed in office. So obviously we were just about to publish the discussion document. Yes. Once we'd had the feedback from that, we would have moved to specific 
proposals to make amendments. Yes. And I suspect at that point, I would have been reading the relevant specific documents. Yeah. Did you know anything about how the department sought to keep up to date with current practices and trends so as to be able to give that practical guidance to industry? Not a great deal. Uh, so I knew, for example, that the department was conducting research. I was often asked to either sign off funding for research projects or sometimes to give approval for the publication of completed pieces of research. Yeah. And I knew also that there was a building uh, regulations advisory committee that officials used to try and have a good link uh, with those involved in the sector and, and, and hear their expertise. And in several of the submissions that came to me, it was clear that officials felt that making any changes could not be a quick process, that there needed to be a deliberative process where they, they sought some of that outside expertise before taking final decisions. But if you're asking me, did I know more detail about the how of how they did all of that? No, I didn't. Yeah. Now, before the Grenfell Tower fire, were you ever made aware of any systematic problems or failings or any potential problems or failings within the construction industry or within the system of building regulation and building control? So I've obviously, before coming to, to give this evidence to you this morning, I've reviewed all of the documents that the department supplied to me. And I can only really see uh, one concern that was clearly expressed to me, which was a concern that competition in building control between local authority building control officers and approved inspectors, that there was a concern that maybe that was leading to, to some worries about compliance. Yeah. That was in the submissions that I've reread to prepare for today, that seemed to be the main concern that was um, being expressed to me. And do you remember being concerned about that at the time, that this drive towards competition within building control was perhaps leading to a race to the bottom in terms of standards? Yes. I, 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 so the way that the briefings were discussed, it didn't seem like an urgent concern, but it clearly was something officials were worried about. And... I think my response to it was that there were clear, there were some clear, some clear benefits to competition, but we needed to make sure that it was working in a way that addressed those concerns. And I, uh, well, you, I'm sure Council will have had a chance to review the speech I gave to the local authority building control officers, but that touches on exactly that subject. Now, um, aside from drafting the building regulations and producing practical <coughs> guidance to assist industry in complying with the regulations, did you understand the department to have any role in reviewing or overseeing how effective that regime was? So my assumption, and it's clear from the department's um, opening statement that this was a false assumption, but my assumption was that the department regarded itself as responsible for the integrity of the system. So in other words, what I mean by that is that it wasn't taking the individual building control decisions. It, it wasn't in charge of resourcing local authority building control departments. But if you'd said to me, we are responsible for the building regulations and the approved documents, I would have assumed we were also responsible for being confident that the building control system was working as it should. And it's clear from the department's opening statement that it, that it acknowledges that it should have thought that way and, and actually wasn't. Yes. Um, I mean, if we look at what Melanie Dawes told us in her oral evidence, can we briefly look at that? It was day 249, page 170. I want to pick it up at line 23. I don't have that in front of me yet. It, it, it'll come up. Yep. So here is her evidence, page 170, and if we look at line 23, um, so she says, you know, at the heart of this, I think, is what I was describing this morning, is a complete failure throughout the preceding decades for the department at any level to see that there was a system oversight role that needed to be played, let alone that the department was accountable for playing it. And so the team were never given any instructions that their role was anything more than maintaining documents. Do you see that? I do, yes. And she goes on later in that answer and says that that's particularly surprising given, if you look at line 19 on that page, she said these were issues of public safety and there was technical confusion and some of that was in the documents themselves, which was the core responsibility of the department. So, you know, she was expressing some, you know, concern 
retrospectively, looking yeah. back, that the department didn't recognise that particularly when it came to issues of public safety, it did have this oversight role, it did have this reviewing role, and ought to have played at least some part, even if not in a formal sense. Now, do you agree with that evidence? I, I do agree with her evidence, uh, and uh, I certainly agree that it is particularly important given the, given the issues of public safety, but perhaps I could give an analogy which is helpful. Okay. The department was also responsible for the planning system. And if you look at our housing white paper, one of the things it acknowledges there is that local authority planning departments were struggling with resources. And so we agreed to increase planning fees in order that local authorities could bring in more resource, provided they spent that on increasing the capacity of uh, their planning departments. And the reason I'm mentioning that to you is that it shows that the planning bit of the department definitely did see it as its responsibility for ensuring that the, the system was functioning properly and had the capacity <coughs> to take good and timely decisions. Yes. And so it surprises me that if that was the view it, would, if it was taking of its overall responsibility for the planning system, again, devolved to local authorities in terms of taking the individual decisions, but the department did see it had an overall responsibility for the integrity of the planning system, which as Melanie identifies in this evidence that you've put before me, it, it clearly mistakenly didn't feel it had in relation to building control. Yes. Now, this may be an unfair question because you were there for less than a year, um, immediately before the Grenfell fire though. Um, can you help us understand, looking back, how that might have come about? What, what might the reasons be for why that building regulations team did not, over many, many years and through lots of different changes of, of officials and, and changes of ministers and secretary of state, not consider themselves responsible, certainly when it came to public safety matters, for the effectiveness of the system? I can't uh, explain that to you, but I think I can just offer one comment which, which may be helpful, which is I think it's really important that responsibility for that failure doesn't just sit with the members of that team. No. Th th there must be something wrong <coughs> in the structure of the department that that failing wasn't identified. And ministers, including myself, have to take some responsibility that we didn't pick up that that wasn't happening. So I think, you know, it's not for me to tell the inquiry what its conclusions would be, but I feel very strongly that even if there were mistakes in that team, it would be wrong for relatively junior civil servants that, to say that well, the whole blame sits yeah. there. That doesn't feel yeah. fair to me. Did you ever detect, you obviously had dealings with Mr Ledsom and, and as you've said, probably others, although you might not be able to remember now exactly when and who they were, but did you ever detect that they were looking at their role in a very narrow way? You know, we just set the regulations and we set the approved documents and what happens when this uh, that leaves the building is somebody else's problem. Did you ever get a flavour of that in your dealings with them? I didn't because if I had, that would have cued me in to sort of say, well, hang on, surely we're responsible for making sure that the system as a whole is working. And, and to give you one example of something that probably uh, led to me failing to pick this up, the comment that was in my briefing about concern about how competition was working implies that they did feel some responsibility for making sure that the system was working okay, yes. at least in that regard. Yes. So that probably falsely reassured me yeah. that they were thinking <coughs> about the integrity of the system when both in the department's opening statement and, and the evidence from Melanie that you've put before me, yes. they clearly acknowledge they weren't. Yes. We're going to come to it later. Uh, we're going to come to a number of pieces of correspondence from external stakeholders raising concerns with the team, and we'll see what was done or what the response was to that. Did you ever get the sense that they were dismissive of outside uh, feedback on uh, how the system was operating, uh, or, or whether indeed their own documents, which they clearly did think they were responsible for, were, were being effective? So I certainly didn't get a sense that their own documents uh, weren't being effective, um, other than in one regard, which was the correspondence from the APPG, which yes. I'm sure you're going to yes. come on and ask me about. Um, in terms of, I think the way you phrased your first question, were they sort of dismissive uh, of outside opinion? Um, in, at, at the time, I think I only once ever got a very slight sense of that. There is... Um, 
and I remember, I, I've reread it, but I remember noticing it at the time when I got the submission. In the, the March 2018 submission. Do you mean 2017? Uh, 2017, yeah. sorry. Yeah, okay. um, Which uh, is the one that's asking me to clear the discussion document for publication that never actually got published because the election was called. Yes. There's a reference there to the fire lobby, which if I had been writing, it, it, I think it is making a perfectly legitimate point for an official to make, but if I had been writing it, I might not have phrased it in those terms. Yes. I, I don't know if you know the reference I'm... I know exactly which sentence you're talking about, yes. I can't, because I haven't got it in front of me, I can't give you... I'll take you to it. But. Yes, I will take you to it later. Yes. Um, I think it's a phrase where it says the fire lobby is powerful. Yeah, something, some, like, something that. like that. Yeah. I can't remember. And won't be happy with what we've done yes. or something like that. Yeah. Mm. We'll come back to that. Let's move on now to the building regulations introductory briefing that you had. So if we go to paragraph 10 on page three of your first statement... You, you tell us this, you say, after I became a minister in the department, I had introductory briefings with each of the teams in my policy areas. Each team would brief me on their work and current issues and challenges in their areas. I received an initial briefing from Bob Ledsom on the work of the building regulations team on the 8th of August, so that will be 2016. I remember it specifically as being one of the last introductory briefings I had. The order of these briefings was determined by my private office. My sense was that it reflected the department's view of the urgency of the issues different teams were dealing with. I've reviewed the slides from the building regulations briefing. The slides do not refer to the Rule 43 letter, that's the coroner's letter from Lacanon, or the recommendations that she made. So that's your um, witness statement there. Mm -hmm. um, now, how did you get the sense that the order of these briefings reflected the department's view of the urgencies of the issues? Was that because of the subject matter of what they were dealing with? You could tell straight away that the first briefings were clearly more urgent and were said to be more urgent than the ones you got at the end. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm going to speak rel relatively candidly here. So I, I had inherited a number of policies from the previous government, mm. previous administration, uh, that were extremely pro problematic. So there was a policy to introduce a right to buy for housing association tenants, which in itself I think was a good thing, but it was to be funded by forcing councils to sell higher value council homes, which was incredibly unpopular. There was a policy of rent control on housing associations, which was holding back supply. There were a number of other issues where starter homes, uh, which there was a fear that they were going to prevent affordable homes for rent being built. So there were a number of these things that I had inherited that, being frank now, were a mess. Uh, and the department didn't know how to pay for them, and it felt the policies weren't right. Uh, and so those issues were the ones that were brought to me first, I think, because they needed urgent resolution. Whereas the impression I got, and I guess you'll, you'll come on to talk about some of the phrases in it from the building regulations briefing was, there were some issues here that we needed to take forward, but there was nothing that was time critical, urgent, that needed uh, action. So the sentence I've given you here, uh, as I said, nobody said this to me explicitly, but it is the judgment I formed from the order in which issues were brought before me in those introductory briefings. Yes, and you tell us, we don't need to go to it, I think in your second statement, that your private secretary had possibly consulted the department about the order, but you, you, you don't know about that, is that right? I, I don't know that for certain. I had an outstanding private secretary, her name's Claire Brunton, who was an amazing civil servant. Uh, and so she did a very effective job of trying to help me organise and cope with the volume of work that was coming across my desk. So it's possible the prioritisation was purely hers, but I would be surprised if she didn't consult with uh, the senior director. There was no director general at that moment for the reasons we've discussed. Yes. But the senior directors about what things they needed to bring to me first. Got you. Yeah. Now, over what period of time did you have these introductory briefings? Can you remember? Was it just over a day or did it last several days? Just three or four weeks. Right. I would guess. So, I mean, yeah. I, I don't have... You, you see here that the, the building regulations briefing is on the 8th of August. Yes. I don't have the earlier text in front of me. I think I got appointed in mid-July. 
Yes, that's yep. right. I don't know the exact date. Yeah. Um, so I would guess it was over a sort of three-week period, maybe. Yeah. And can you remember how long, roughly, the building regulations team briefing lasted? You've told us it's on the 8th of August. Was it the whole day? Was it an hour? So it certainly wouldn't have been the whole day. I suspect it would have been an hour, hour, hour and a half, maybe. Yeah. But that's, uh, to be clear, that's a, that's a guess rather than being able to remember the length of a meeting. Yeah. And what did you understand the perfect purpose of that introductory briefing on the building regulations to be? So one of the things that, that may be helpful to the inquiry to understand is when you become a minister, you're obviously not an expert in that area at all. And I, I've said to you already that I was lucky that I was appointed to something that I had some knowledge of. But you are immediately expected to be able to do the job. Actually, I was appointed on a Sunday, and on the Monday at 2.30, I was in the House of Commons asking, answering questions. So the first day in the job was literally on the four questions I was going to be asked, trying to cram me up to speed on those things so that I could deal with that. So I think the purpose of the introductory briefings is very quickly to try and get ministers up to speed on what it is that they are responsible for, what current policy is any immediate decisions that are likely to be coming their way, and then maybe what are the longer term challenges that the department is wrestling with that it doesn't have an immediate answer to. Uh, so that, those, I think, would be the things that you would try and cover at one of these discussions. That's very helpful. So just to be absolutely clear, you didn't understand that this was just a briefing about how the building regulations worked in terms of nuts and bolts. This was also a briefing that was meant to cover uh, looking forward as to what challenges were ahead, what policy issues needed to be dealt with, what immediate issues dealt with, yes? Yes, and I, I, I don't have the document in front of me, but I think there is a slide that specifically refers to that yes. in the briefing. Now, we'll come on, and I'm going to ask you this again later, um, so we don't need to deal with it in, in detail now, but you tell us in your witness statements that you <clears throat> received a phone call from the Prime Minister, Theresa May, on the 17th of July 2016, just a few days after taking office, in which you say you were given a clear steer that the key priority was addressing the housing supply crisis. Now, just focusing on this question, do you think that that might have influenced your thoughts in terms of the priorities of the department at the time and how you viewed these introductory presentations? Definitely. But I would add, want to add one important point of context. Uh, it wasn't just that. So this inquiry, rightly, is going to focus on government. But I think it is a really important point of context to say that in the 10 months when I was the minister, I never got asked a question in Parliament about the building regulations. I never got asked, I, I did two long interviews with Inside Housing, sort of specialist media, not a single question about the building regulations or fire safety. So clearly from the, from the compelling evidence that this inquiry has already received, the government had a completely false picture of the level of fire safety, but it wasn't just the government. Mm. This wasn't an issue that was being raised by the opposition, with the exception of the APPG, it wasn't being raised by backbench MPs, <coughs> I wasn't being asked about it in Parliament, I wasn't being asked about it by the media. So, I, I, sorry for giving you a longer answer, definitely what the Prime Minister said to me had an effect, but there are other things that could have happened that would have made me change that judgment that didn't happen. And I think that's important okay. context. Yes. Now let's look at the briefing slides that you were given. These are CLG 3019362. You refer to these in your witness statement. So we can see this was the introduction to building regulations and energy performance of buildings, July 2016 by Bob Ledsom in the building regulations and energy performance division. And if we go to page three, there's a box in the left hand, that top left hand corner box. We can see in green, there's white writing uh, that says, we've seen real improvements in fire safety, for example, and then some statistics. In 1979, 865 people in the UK died from fires in dwellings. 30 years later, this number had fallen to 353. And you can see that's based on home office statistics, yes? Yes. Now, do you remember these statistics actually being discussed at the meeting or did they simply appear on the slides? Do you remember somebody saying to you, 
listen, um, deaths from fire are falling, and these are the, the statistics. Uh, I can't say with certainty, but my memory is somebody talked through these slides, so it would have been discussed, I think. Yes. Did Mr Levson in any way elaborate on the real improvements in fire safety that there'd been uh, over and above the statistical data on fatalities? Uh, I've tried to be as helpful as I can to you so far, but I honestly can't remember that level of what he might have said when talking to the slide, I'm afraid. Yes. Were you comforted? Um, do you remember being comforted by statistics that were uh, given to you during this uh, meeting? I mean, you yes. say in your statement, from my initial briefing with officials, I understood that fire safety policy was working, that fatalities from fires were decreasing. Is it right that you, you, you gained some comfort from this? I think with, with the clear benefit of hindsight, I gained a completely false situational awareness. Yes. And, and can we agree that those statistics tell you nothing about the number of fires that have occurred in dwellings in the UK, nor anything about the number of people injured as opposed to killed? That, that is a fair comment to make, yes. And that they therefore tell a very incomplete picture of fire events in the UK? They, they, they don't tell a complete picture. That's a, yeah. that's a fair comment to make, yes. At the time, were you aware that reliance on statistics can be dangerously misleading as a predictor of catastrophic failure? When you say, was I aware of that, if you'd, if you'd said that to me in a meeting, I would have probably reflected on it and thought that there could be some truth in that. But was it something I was aware of consciously? No. Or any, anyone in the department? I mean, I, 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 I had studied Sorry. statistics, so I, you know, I, I, I felt comfortable dealing with statistics. Uh, and obviously, if the point you're making is that even if, even if risk is falling, there's still a, you know, the possibility of a, a, an event that has multiple fatalities, I would have understood that. But we didn't, that detail wasn't discussed, I think, at the meeting. Yes, and I think one of the points I'm making is that even if deaths from fire are falling, there may be other yes. information out there that's building, that's gathering, which might suggest that a catastrophic failure is becoming not only a possibility, but then actually yes. more of a probability. And, and none of that information was shared at the meeting. Otherwise, I would have had a different understanding of the situation. Yes. I think we both need to slow down a bit <laughs> for the transcriber. I'll try and do my bit of that bargain. Um, were you ever made aware that, in fact, uh, Brian Martin, who we know was the technical policy lead in the department on fire safety, was of the view that the reduction in the total number of fires uh, and deaths was mostly attributable to a number of factors not related to building standards. Did anyone ever discuss that with you? I don't believe so, no. Right. You're referring to things like fewer people smoking in the home or... Well, we'll come back to that. I just want to know whether anyone uh, said to you, actually, these statistics um, and what we see in terms of these falling statistics um, are attributable to factors which don't relate to building standards. So, yes, like the introduction of alarms, things like that. Uh, so, that, that w I don't think that was discussed in the meeting, and I would argue that the way that the slide is phrased um, implies that, not necessarily about building standards, I certainly think alarms could be covered here if you look at the, the visual that's included in that box. But if yes. you're talking about things like this being due more to people smoking less, that wasn't touched on at all, no. Yes. Now, Mr. Ledsom has said in his witness statement to the inquiry for the transcript, this is paragraph 96, page 26 of CLG 3019465, that he doesn't recall any fire safety issues being discussed at this meeting. Uh, is that consistent with your recollection? I'm not sure what he means by fire safety issues, so it's a difficult question to answer. I mean, like, is he saying that he doesn't think that slide was discussed? <coughs> That's all I can put to you, which is, is that he doesn't recall there being any discussion of fire safety issues so at this. My recollection is that we talked through these slides. So I certainly think we would have covered that top <coughs> slide. Yes. He, he may be referring to some of the more detailed points you're talking about, in which case he would be right. Yes. I think he told us that he didn't think he talked through every single slide. Right. Um, so that's why that's a possibility. Um, at this time, do you remember having any discussion about a discussion document, you referred to it, uh, which the department was working on to identify potential areas of work within the approved document on fire safety? 
I, I don't recall that being discussed at this briefing, but I wouldn't completely rule out the possibility that there's no, there's no reference to it in the slides. I don't have a memory of it. It's possible that someone could have mentioned it, and I don't recall that at this distance. My first, from the papers I've read, the first reference I can see to the discussion document is the submission that comes in September. Yes, which I'm coming to. Yeah. Um, and what about the fire at Lackanell House? Um, can you recall there being any discussion at this stage about the Lackanell House fire? So I've tried to clarify that in my evidence statements. I, I, can't, I can't absolutely remember. It was Steve Quartermain yeah. who first spoke to me about it. And I can't remember absolutely when he spoke to me about it. It was informally at the end of a meeting. And I think I say in my first witness statement, it could have been at this meeting or it could have been at the briefing meeting for the question that I was thought I was going to be asked about the building regulations. Yes. In the second witness statement, I think I say that I believe it was probably the latter. Yes. It was did. in October. And, the, and just to be clear with the inquiry, why I believe that, it's because the, the department subsequently provided me with the detailed briefing notes for that oral question. Yes. That have a reference to it. Yes, exactly. And I think that's what would have prompted Steve to say to me something verbally about it at the end of the meeting. Yes. Um, so I can't say for certain to you, but my belief is that Lacanel was not mentioned at this briefing. Yes. Now, if we look at your second witness statement, page three, paragraph six, you tell us there, uh, you say at paragraph six, I was aware of the fact there had been a fire at Lackanell House prior to my appointment as housing minister. I remember reading a news article about it at the time, and then you, you go on. So, so you obviously had some awareness before this point, just in general. Um, what exactly did you know about the Lackanell House fire before taking office? C can you help us with that? Very little. I think probably if you'd said the word Lackanell to me, that wouldn't have cued me in, but I remembered there being a bad fire that people had died in. Uh, I think it was in, in Southwark. Yeah. So, uh, so literally just awareness in the back of my mind that there had been a serious fire yeah. in Southwark. And did you know at that point that there'd been an inquest, uh, quite a, an involved inquest into that? I didn't uh, know, incident. although I obviously, given having, had I, having been a councillor, I would have assumed there would have been one but I didn't, I didn't know the detail of what the inquest, the coroner's letter, any of that, no. No, yeah. Um, what about the commitment to review approved document B on fire safety? Do you remember there being any discussion at this introductory briefing about there having been a commitment to review the approved document um, or indeed the timeframes for that? No, and I'm pretty confident that that wasn't discussed at this meeting because... The, the tenor of Steve Quartermain's conversation with me when he tells me about it is there's something you should know about. You're, you're about to go into the House of Commons to answer a question and there's a thing that you haven't been told about that you need to know about, which is this commitment. Yes. Uh, so I'm, I can't say for you for certainty, but I'm pretty confident that was not mentioned at this meeting. Yes, thank you. Can we agree now that you should have been given at least some information about the Lacanel fire and the coroner's recommendations at this introductory briefing? So the, the straight answer to your question is, is yes. But I do want to put on record, overall, I had the highest regard for the officials that I worked with. And I don't want to come here today and, and just sort of say, well, it's, it's all the officials' fault that I wasn't told. But I, I have to answer your question honestly. I wish that I had been aware of it at this point. Yeah. And when do I, you think they should have told you? I think they should. So when, when I am told about it, there are then also, and this is probably I'm going ahead of, to where council wants to go subsequently, but there are two flaws in what I'm then told. I'm told the wrong deadline. So I'm told the commitment was to do it by the end of this parliament, which would be 2020. And as the department acknowledges in its opening statement, I'm not told that the department doesn't think this is a safety critical thing. Um, so I can't say anything other to council other than that, of course, knowing what I know, I wish I had been told at the start that there was this commitment that the deadline was very rapidly approaching March 2017, 
was the deadline, as I understand it, Secretary of State Pickles had, had given, and that I'd understood that this was a safety critical issue, because clearly had I known those things, my behaviour would have been completely different to what it was. Yes, and just to be clear, I'm sure we'll come to it when we look at what you were told, but um, when exactly were you told that the commitment was to do it by the end of the Parliament, which would be 2020? So I, uh, I think the document was supplied to the inquiry, but there is a, uh, whenever you answer a oral questions in the House, you'll, you'll have five or six questions maybe that you as the Minister are responding to. And what you'll get is you'll get the question that the MP is asking, the initial question, the answer you're going to read out, and then the officials will try to guess the supplementary question that the Member of Parliament is going to ask based on what are the what are the obvious things they could ask about, or they might do a bit of research into what does this MP care about. Uh, and that briefing document, um, I don't know if it's possible to get it up on screen, but it, it has a sentence in it uh, that says, after the death of six people in Lackanel House, Secretary of State Pickles made a commitment to simplify approved document B by the end of this parliament, or something to that Yes, we're coming effect. to that, yes. So that's, it was in that <coughs> briefing document. So it was at that point and not before that you would hold that, yeah? In terms of timing, yes. Yeah. So when Steve Quartermain spoke to me verbally, which would have been a, around the same meeting, obviously, it was, a, it was a conversation as a meeting broke up, he didn't mention a deadline. Yeah. He simply said, you should be aware there was this coroner's letter that made four recommendations. We've dealt with three of them. One is outstanding. It's around simplification of the document. We're going to do it as part of a wider review of the building regulations. That was the sort of tenor of what Steve said to me. Yes, I follow. And did anyone ever actually say to you, this work following the Lackanel House fire is not life safety critical? Did anyone actually say that? No, no. But the, the very clear presumption was that it wasn't because we were wrapping it into a wider, longer term review that was going to take time. Thank you, that's helpful. Now, if we go back to the slides from the introductory briefing. Yes. And uh, on page three, the box in the bottom right-hand corner has a heading in the, the, the purple or blue, I think it's blue actually, part. It says, but there are emerging risks which we need to keep on top of, such as dot, dot, dot. And then we have a number of bullet points. And the bottom bullet point says this. It says, we need to understand the risks which new methods of construction may bring, e.g. timber frame buildings. Now... You may not be able to remember this, but I do have to ask you, were any other new methods of construction discussed at this point? I don't believe so. I, I say that because I can't ever recall anybody ever talking to me about cladding, about ACM, ACM with a PE core. I've been through all of the documents that have been released to the inquiry, and I can't find any reference to any of those things in writing, and I don't recall everyone, anyone ever talking to me about them uh, verbally. But I do recall, I think I recall, a little bit of a discussion about that last bull point, because one of the things that the department was interested in was encouraging modern methods of construction. And we were interested in that from a supply point of view, because we were trying to significantly increase the number of homes that were being built and there were constraints on the labour force that actually using <coughs> new methods of construction might be one way of enabling us to boost the total supply of homes we were getting. So I think there was a bit of dis discussion about that bottom ballpoint, but I, your question, I think, was trying to imply, did it go on to other methods of construction? I don't think that it did. OK, thank you. Was there any discussion about any conflict between the requirements of Part L on energy efficiency and fire safety? Was that general topic ever discussed? I don't think so, no. Uh, I do recall um, some discussion about the first bullet point there uh, in terms of there was a discussion about how the focus had been very much on energy performance and insulation and that actually now there was a rising danger of the opposite problem, not homes being uh, too cold and people having to spend too much to heat them, but the risk of overheating. But I don't recall any discussion of a conflict between Part L and Part B. Yeah. 
Is it fair to say that in general, modern methods of construction were seen as a positive in terms of the, helping with the housing supply crisis? Certainly in relation to... Uh, I'm not sure if that's necessarily true in terms of the cladding issues, but if you just said to me the phrase MMC, is that a good thing? My reaction at the time would have been yes, because it's, it's helping us to bring innovation into the industry and to increase supply. Yeah. Now, if we move on to page six of this document, we can see from the main heading in the top right-hand corner, the focus of this slide right at the very top is on deregulation. And it says underneath that, it says, building regulations and standards have delivered significant deregulation and there is potential for further savings to business. Do you see that? I do, yes. And then um, in the, bot the box at the bottom right-hand corner, we can see a series of bullet points under the heading, there is the potential to achieve further savings to business. First bullet, the government is committed to further reducing regulatory burdens on business and to reduce the regulatory burden on home builders. So identifying ways to deregulate or reduce costs to business will be a fundamental consideration in our future reviews of regulations, the building control system or statutory guidance included in the approved documents. And then it goes on, we think that there are opportunities, for example, to improve the approved documents and make them easier to use. Do you see that? I do. Now, I'm going to come on, I think, after the break to discuss deregulation with you in a little bit more detail. Um, but focusing on this uh, for the moment, what deregulation in broad terms did you understand had already been delivered by the Building Regulations and Standards Division? Did you have any understanding of no, that? I, no, I don't. If you'd asked me what detailed statu changes to the requirements or secondary legislation had been passed, I wouldn't have been able to answer that question. Yeah. And when you took up your post as minister, what did you understand to be the key work streams, based on this briefing, for the department to be in relation to the building regulations and the associated guidance? So this, this slide slightly surprised me. Um, I'm, I may be being... I've, I've said that I have a very high regard for the officials that I used to work with, but, and I may be being unfair on them, but I... My, if you'd asked me my starting assumption before I became a policy minister, it would be that ministers have to push quite hard the case for deregulation. And there's a sort of natural instinct in the machine to, to build up what we have. And so I was quite surprised how strongly the department was playing back to me uh, on deregulation. I think that that bottom right slide there, to my mind at the time and now still, conflates two things, which is, are you, um, are you simplifying something to make it easier to understand, which, which may well be deregulation. It may well be that by simplifying and clarifying language that actually compliance costs for business is reduced, or are you actually changing the technical standards in some way uh, that, is, that is delivering a saving? And the last ballpoint, I think, is clear that it's about simplification and clarification. The previous two could be read either way. Um, so I think if you're asking me what did I understand the key issues to be going forward, definitely something about making these documents easier for people to use. Yeah. I think there was reference at this meeting, if not it came quite soon afterwards, to a desire to change the format of the approved documents to make them much more user-friendly. Um, but in terms of specific uh, deregulation proposals, it wasn't clear from this slide. You may want me to return to this later after the break, but one of the things that I would say to you about deregulation is that obviously I was appointed as a minister in a new government, and it was a government of the same party as the previous government, but I think that there was a change of emphasis. And if you look at the language in the housing white paper, <coughs> it's a bit different to this. Right. Can you just help me with this? Um, <clears throat> presumably the primary function of those who were dealing with building regulations was to produce the most effective regulatory regime possible. Did it surprise or even concern you that when you were being briefed about building regulations, such emphasis was given on deregulation? So it, it surprised me a little. So, I mean, look, I'm in favour of... But it might suggest, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but it, it might suggest that the deregulatory mindset had become, if not uppermost, at least very high 
in, in the thoughts of those whose job was not so much to deregulate, but to get the regulations right. So th that's what I was hinting at. I think by the time you look at the housing white paper, and again, I haven't got the document in front of me, there's a reference to deregulation while maintaining standards. Mm. And, and that's an important change of tone. To me, when the state regulates in any way, shape or form, you're trying to strike the right balance between the necessary standards and subject to that, keeping the cost for people to comply with those regulations as low as possible. And that is obviously particularly true when you're regulating something that is about fundamental human safety, uh, essentially. So um, I was, I wouldn't say concerned, I was just a bit surprised. And maybe this is best left till council ask me about the documents, but I, I do think this was something that the Cameron government and particularly had, had driven hard on and that the May government, if you'd asked the Prime Minister, I'm sure she would have said she was in favour of deregulation. Mm -hmm. But the tone changes as you look at the, the September 2016 submission, the white paper, the March 2017 submission. I think you can see uh, a change in tone in regard to this yeah. area. Right. Thank, thank you. That's helpful. Thank you. No, that's very helpful. Um, I think that would be an appropriate moment for the break, because I'm right. going to come to this topic in more detail immediately after. Yes. All right. Well, uh, Lord Barwell, as you probably know, we do have a break during each session, and this is the time to have the morning break. So we'll stop now. We'll resume, please, at 20 to 12. And uh, as with all the other witnesses, I have to ask you, please, not to talk about your evidence or anything relating to it to anyone while you're out of the room. Of course. All right. Thank you very much. Would you go with the usher, please? I will do. Thank you. Thank you very much. 20 to 12, please. Thank you. Thank you.
Would you ask Lord Barwell to come back in, please? Okay. Right, Lord Barwell, ready, ready to carry on? I am. Good, thank you very much. Yes, Miss Grange, when you're ready. Yes, thank you. Now, I want to ask you some more detailed questions now about deregulation and your understanding of the effect that that had on the department. And, and just going over the history, we know that the one-in, one-out uh, policy was an administrative policy that was introduced in 2011 and operated within government, whereby, in theory, no new regulation would be introduced without a compensating reduction in regulation being made. Now, was that your understanding? It's my understanding, but only only based as someone who was a backbench MP at the, ta at the time and, and read about it in the news. I'm not sure if that policy was in effect under the May government or not. Well, did you have any direct experience of one in, one out, and later one in, two out, which was introduced in 2013, before your time at the department? Uh, again, only by reference to, to reading that those were government policies in the media. Right. I was, I was a backbench MP and then I was a, a government whip, so I wasn't a policy minister until I was appointed housing and planning minister. Yeah. And were you aware that in early 2016, so not long before you became junior housing minister, um, that that had become one in three out? No. You weren't aware of that at all? No, and I'm not sure if that policy was in effect in the period when I was a minister. There were never any submissions that I can think of that referenced it. Right. Now, a, a paragraph 29A, page 8 of your, um, I think it's your second statement, um, you tell us that uh, one in, one out was introduced in January 2011. Sorry, let's get it up on the page. Paragraph 29A, page 8. Yes, you tell us there, you say the one in, one out rule introduced in January 2011 was extended to one in, two out in January 2013 and one in, three out on the 3rd of March 2016. Sorry, can, can I interrupt you? Did you yes. say this was my statement? I beg your pardon. Sorry, you're correct. This, this is, is the Bob statement Ledsom's. of Mr. Ledsom. Mm -hmm. And he says there in that last sentence, there was no exemption for building regulations from these rules. Do you see that? I see it, yes. So it sounds like from what you're saying that um, you didn't have much uh, awareness during the time you were housing minister of this one in, uh, three out policy. I, I don't even know if it was still government policy under the new, under the May administration, and if it was, it was certainly never referenced to my knowledge in any submission that came to me. Right. So you weren't aware that you were actively implementing that policy during your time as housing minister? I, I would put it even more strongly than that. I'm not sure if I was actively implementing that policy when I was housing minister. If I was, I wasn't aware of it. Right. And um, what was your understanding of the red tape challenge? Had you been aware of the red tape challenge in 2012? Uh, again, I recognised the phrase. I couldn't describe to you in detail. I mean, it sounds like it was some piece of work that Oliver Letwin was probably leading on, trying to identify uh, pieces of legislation that could be removed from the statute book. But I, I wasn't a minister then. I don't have any detailed knowledge of it. Right. Yes. Uh, and going back to one in, three out, we understand that it came in in March 2016. Yes? Does that help? Well, it, it, says, it says here in Bob, Bob's um, witness statement, 3rd of March 2016. Yes, but that, but that doesn't help in terms of your awareness of it. I, I definitely haven't forgotten it. So yes. all, all I'm saying to you is I don't know whether the policy ceased to apply under the May government or whether it continued to apply and no one drew my attention to it. Right. Did you ever discuss the impact of the deregulatory policies in terms of their historical impact on the department with either of your predecessors, either James Wharton or Brandon Lewis? Definitely not with James because I didn't have a, any kind of handover discussion with him. I don't recall deregulation coming up in my discussion with Brandon. I think it was mainly about these difficult issues that I referred to in an earlier uh, answer in terms of 
um, sale of high value council homes, rent control, some of those some of those things that were live issues that he was handing on to me. Yeah. Did you ever think about whether it was possible to exempt certain regulations or guidance from it from the one in three out policy? Did that ever occur to you as something to to, to apply your mind to? No, and I, again, I don't mean to be unhelpful. I've tried today to be as helpful as I can in answering your questions, but because I didn't know that there was a one in three out policy and was never told that it was applying, that n that never occurred to me. I think what I can say to you is if officials had come to me and made the case that they thought that certain things should be exempted from it, I would have been very willing to make that case to others in government. I think if you look at my record when I was housing minister on things like sale of high value assets, supported housing, rent controls, I proved that I was willing to push back on policies that the May government had inherited from the Cameron government that I didn't think were good policies. Right. But I can't say to you I considered it because it was never raised with me. When you saw, and we saw it before the break, mention of deregulation in the building regulations briefing, and given that you say you were not aware of the one in three out policy, did you think to ask officials about what was envisaged in terms of deregulation? No, um, I, mean, look, I, I was supportive of deregulation, provided we were still maintaining the necessary standards, as, as, I, as I said in answer to the chairman uh, earlier. And my assumption was that those discussions <coughs> would come once we responded to the discussion document, that once we had got specific proposals following that consultation, at that point would be the moment to challenge, well, what are the particular areas where we're looking to, to make changes? Right. The, 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 the briefing documents up till then had merely referred to deregulation as one of the objectives of policy. I didn't disagree with that, although I was, as I said, slightly surprised by the emphasis put on it. Um, but no, I think the time at which I would have challenged or maybe pushed particular proposals would have been after the response to the discussion document. Yes. Uh, if you'd been asked at the time, what deregulatory policies, what specific policies are the officials in the department working to, what would your answer have been? I wouldn't, I wouldn't have known um, the answer to that question because I don't think there were specific measures that were being worked on um, other than late in my time as housing minister, when I became aware of the work on approved document B, there is a submission that refers to ongoing work simplifying the language in the approved documents. So if you'd asked me that question that you just posed in say February or March of 2017, that's what I would probably have referred to in response. Yeah. Help us with this. How would officials in the department have been made aware that they were no longer to work rigidly to those deregulatory policies? Well, the, policy, the policies weren't coming from, I presume, in terms of what Bob's referring to here, the policies weren't coming from the Secretary of State. They were, they were collective policies of the government, which were being driven from the Cabinet Office. So I presume, I don't know the answer to this, whatever the position was under the May government would have come partly from uh, right rounds from the Minister for the Cabinet Office and maybe internally to the Permanent Secretary within the Civil Service Network. Right, so there should have been some right arounds from the Minister for the Cabinet Office and maybe the Perm Sec within the civil service network informing civil servants about what deregulatory policies they were or weren't working to. Yeah, if there were, if there were particular targets or policies that superseded these, yes. Yes. Can you help us with this as well? That um, We've heard considerable evidence from civil servants in the building regulations team about the pressures that they felt under to satisfy the government's deregulatory agenda and the way in practice that really did affect their work, they said, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And yet we've heard from you and we heard from James Wharton that the deregulatory agenda wasn't a particular focus. Can you help us understand how we've got two ministers him, James Wharton and now you, who are both saying it wasn't a particular focus. In fact, you know, yes, deregulation generally, but nothing specific. 
And yet the civil servants at the bottom appear to have been literally crushed, if their evidence is accepted, by the weight of these de deregulatory policies. Help us with that. So I'll try my best to help. Uh, I can't speak for James, obviously, but the answers I've tried to give you relate to the period when I was in government. So if, if the officials are saying that they felt under extreme pressure from me to pursue this deregulatory agenda in the, in the 10 months or so when I'm a minister, I'm at a loss to understand how that can be the case. And I, th and I would observe to you that if you called up the white paper, which had a number of proposals to strengthen the building regulations in relation to broadband provision, in relation to the accessibility of buildings, in relation to the energy performance of buildings. It definitely also had a reference to deregulation, but it caveated it clearly mm. with the phrase while maintaining standards. So I would like to think that if officials were asked about what they got from myself and from the Secretary of State, certainly there would still be some reference to deregulation, but caveated, and there were definitely areas where we were prepared to proceed with new proposals I don't recall, in terms of your reference to one in, one out, one in, two out, one in, three out, I don't recall in the right rounds that we ever came under any other pressure to have to deregulate in other areas in order to put those commitments uh, into the white paper. And the final thing I would say to you is, as, as I hinted at earlier, if you compare the September 2016 submission on the discussion document textually with the March 2017 one, there is a very significant difference of emphasis, both on deregulation, but also in terms of setting out lots of areas where the technical standards need to be improved. Um, so, in summary, if that, if that feedback that I haven't seen that you're referring to in terms of the evidence that officials given, if that relates to my period as minister, I'm at a loss to understand it. Right. If it relates to the previous period, I would certainly say that the Cameron government and Oliver Letwin, I think, was the minister at the cabinet office pushing it, there was a very big agenda there. So although I wasn't in the department and I can't tell you what it was like at the time, as a backbench MP, I can, I can see where that might have come from. Yes. But in terms of my own period as minister, I'm not saying we weren't interested in deregulation at all, but I think there was a much more nuanced approach under the May government to that um, than, than under the previous government. Yes, you see, I'm not aware that, um, and I'll be corrected from behind if I'm wrong, that uh, Bob Ledsom or Richard Harrell uh, drew any distinction between y your time and, and the May government in terms of deregulation and the period before, albeit there is an emphasis in their witness statements about a step change when the coalition government came in, that there was very heavy emphasis on deregulation. But it appears that they felt all the way through this period and up to the Grenfell fire that deregulation was a very pressing part of their agenda and something which we've heard definitely influenced. For example, Brian Martin saying he wasn't amending approved document B in part because getting anything changed was difficult. So, so we I don't have a, any distinction drawn between that period of government and your period of government. Um, help me with this. How would those officials know that you had had less emphasis on deregulation? Were they just meant to work it out by listening to what, you know, officials were saying or, you know, ministers or the prime minister were saying? Or was there ever anything that went down to them which said, by the way, yes, deregulation is good, but the emphasis is now on quality, it's on safety. Do we ever see that? Yeah, so, so I think there are clear policy documents that the government publishes that say that very clearly. The tone is very different uh, in the housing white paper. And you will never find, at least from the documents that have been shared with me from the department, where I'm feeding back on submissions and saying, I don't think you've gone far enough on the deregulation front here. I want to see more on that. That's not the feedback that I was giving. The feedback I was giving was particularly on part B and part M. I wanted to see them develop the technical standards further. So I, 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 if, if that's what the witnesses have said to you, then that is an important record of how they felt. And it's not for me to contradict that. But all I can say to you is, if you look both at the responses from my office when I read submissions, or you look at the policy documents that I approved, I genuinely think that there is a tonal difference. 
And I think in other areas of policy, officials in the department would have felt that I had shown a willingness to row back on policies that I had inherited that I didn't think were good policies. Yes, but it sounds of like what you said earlier, and, and again, is this fair, that officials ought to have picked up from the tone of the housing white paper that deregulation was no longer such a pressure. Is that what you're saying? It's not from the tone. We, we agreed the policy collectively. It's, it's the actual policy measures that were in there. So, it, and again, I'm not saying that the Secretary of State and I had given up on deregulation altogether. We weren't interested in it. Of course, because we were trying to increase supply of housing, we would have wanted to identify any areas where it would be possible without cutting standards to reduce the cost to people of building homes because that would enable more homes to be built. So it wasn't that we had walked away from this agenda altogether, but there are specific policies in the white paper if you go if you go back and study it in relation to the energy performance of homes, in relation to access standards, in relation to broadband provision, which demonstrate not just a change of tone, but a clear willingness on behalf of the Secretary of State and myself to agree things that were imposing additional requirements on people building homes, where we felt that there was a strong policy justification in terms of the, the <coughs> benefits outweighing the cost that, that would be imposed. But help me with this. How was somebody in the building regulations division, like Brian Martin, who was a technical specialist, meant to understand from the housing white paper that deregulation was no longer such a burden for him? How was that actually communicated to people like him in the department? Well, he would have been in involved, I suspect, in clearing the specific wording on those policies. It's not that the Secretary of State and I wrote the housing white paper off in some ivory tower on ourselves and then published it. The wording of the, the policy content, and you can imagine when you're trying to get a white paper approved in government, there's continual processes of writing what's called a right round to other departments saying, this is what we're thinking of saying on this. What do you think? And you get some pushback. So I remember, particularly on the energy performance standards, um, we got pushback from both directions. The, the business department that, that was responsible for climate change wanted us to go further. Uh, and the Treasury, which was always worried about regulatory cost and burden, was nervous. And we ended at a sort of compromise wording. But I can't say to you f for absolute certain, but some of those officials would have been involved in drafting the language that was in the white paper. It wouldn't have been done, uh, if you like, separate from them and they were just expected to understand that this had happened. They would have been intrinsically involved in the process. Right. Some of them, but, but certainly not all of them. And, and what I'm really getting at is how internally within the department was this communicated so that those civil servants knew that they, they didn't need to fear that a change which protected life safety would be dismissed by ministers simply because it was regulation, because that does appear to have been the climate in which they thought they were working in. So I would answer your question, I think, in two ways. The first thing is I would be horrified if any civil servant in that department was ever scared to come to me and say, this is what I think you should be doing. I tried to create a climate with the officials that I worked with where people would be confident to say, this is where we believe policy should go. I might not always agree with them, mm. but I certainly wanted a climate where <coughs> officials felt comfortable doing that. And I tried, <laughs> with limited success, this isn't easy with the civil service, but I tried when we were in private meetings to say to officials, you don't all have to agree with each other in this meeting. They would you would tend to get a submission where you had the director general, the director, the grade seven, and all their names were on a submission. And I used to say to them, you can't possibly all have exactly the same opinion on this question. This is a, when we go out in public, we all have to take the government's line, but in a private meeting like this, if there are differences of opinion within the team, I want to hear them because that's gonna help me make a decision. So the first way I would answer your question is I just wanna put on record if it's genuinely true that there were officials in the department that were nervous about coming to me and saying, this is what I think is wrong with policy at the moment, I would be horrified to learn that. That's not the climate that I tried to create at all. But on your specific question, how should they have known? Uh, I think I would say, A, some of them were 
intrinsically involved in the policy development work, but obviously I would hope that the, the chain of command within the department, those officials like Steve Quartermain who were spending significant chunks of time with me every week, would be cascading down to their teams what my reactions to submissions were and, and what I was saying to them in those meetings. Yeah. Help me with this. Um, did you ever ask any official to filter down a new message, a different message, a shift in focus away from deregulation to those within people like, for example, the building regulations division? Did you ever ask for that to happen? Specifically to that division, no, but I think I gave a very clear impression that whilst I still wanted to look for opportunities to deregulate, I was also prepared to look at opportunities to tighten policy in those areas where we could demonstrate that there was a public policy benefit from doing so. And I communicated that clearly, I think, both by words and actions. Yes, I see. I mean, Richard Harrell, the head of technical policy, told, him during that, told us that during his time in office, that he understood regulation to be, quotes, bad, and that even where there were regulatory proposals which might be superficially attractive to ministers, once it was recognised it was regulation, they would pull back from that because it was not the way they wanted to drive change. Now, do you recognise that uh, occurring during your time in office? No, I do not. Um, certainly, uh, I would say unnecessary regulation, bad, but as I said, like, I don't want to repeat myself, but the white paper clearly demonstrates a willingness to impose new regulation where I didn't think it was bad, where I thought that there was a case for making those changes. So this isn't just about what I was saying internally in meetings, it's what the Secretary of State and I were doing, and we were battling with other government departments to get collective approval to those positions. I can't I don't know when Richard said that, whether he was talking about the whole period he was doing the job, and I can't speak to the period before I became a minister, but I've tried to give you an honest account of what we tried to do in the period when we were there. Yes. Now, that does not absolve us of this entirely because we still did have a deregulatory agenda. The white paper still refers to deregulation where possible, but it was a different tone, and that's an important point that I wanted to make today. Exactly. I mean, can you accept that that might be the difficulty here, is that, you've, as you've just told us, you did still want to look for opportunities to deregulate, and the white paper, if people read it, still had deregulation as a key focus. So the difficulty is that the, the, the civil servants who've been working under these pressures for a very long time, unless they're given a very clear message that something has changed, are, aren't they reasonably going to carry on thinking that deregulation needs to be their first priority? So, again, let me, let me just try and answer the question in um, two parts. I would expect any government of any political complexion at all to still be interested in deregulation, to still be trying to identify if there are things that are still on the statute book that are no longer necessary or if there are things that can be done better in a more cost-effective way. Um, so I'm not going to uh, apologise for having any kind of reference to deregulation. But in terms of how were officials meant to know, um, all I can say to you is that I think across the board in housing policy, the May government changed a whole load of policies um, from those that we inherited from the Cameron government, uh, whether it was starter homes, whether it was um, in relation to... Um, sale of high-value council homes. There are a whole load of areas, rent controls, where we tried to shift policy, and that was recognised in the sector. So I would hope officials saw the very clear evidence that ministers were willing to relook at these things. But if people have told you what you're telling me they've told you, that is an important matter of record. Mm. Yeah. Did you know, for example, that in 2016, and I, I don't think a specific date in 2016 was given, the better regulation unit within MHCLG effectively told officials within the building regulations division not to propose any new regulation. Were you aware of that? No, uh, and their instruction obviously wasn't very effective because in the white paper that was published at the start of 2017, there were areas where we strengthened regulation. But I wasn't aware that that instruction was given. No, and I, I don't know whether that happened under my period post 
um, post July or not. Yeah. We saw in the briefing that Bob Levson gave you in August 2016 that there was clear reference there to deregulation and it being a key priority for that team. Do you remember ever having any other specific conversations with Bob Ledsom about deregulation and how much pressure there was to deregulate in terms of his specific work streams? No, I don't, I don't recall any occasion where officials raised the kinds of concerns that you've identified in, in the quotes that you've given to me, with me personally at any point. We obviously talked about what was in the discussion document, but I don't think that's what you were asking me. You were, yeah. If I understood you right, you were trying to ask me, did officials ever vocalise to me the pressure that they felt under on the deregulation front? They, they, they didn't, no. Did you ever ask officials about how much pressure they had felt during previous administrations to deliver that deregulatory agenda? Did you ever raise that topic yourself with them? I, I don't know. I don't know if I... I might have commented, but very gently, on, along the lines of what I said to the chairman in the first bit of this evidence session, that I was surprised at how strong the emphasis was, but I, I can't say for certain that I did that. Yes. Melanie Dawes, when she gave evidence, didn't say to us that she thought the one in, three out just didn't apply and wasn't a policy. She says she recalls thinking that the department almost certainly wouldn't be able to deliver on it and that she was going to have to have some difficult discussions to push back heavily on it. She said it was her evidence that uh, it was an extremely onerous request and lots of the low-hanging fruit had already been taken, but she, so she didn't think they were going to be able to deliver and she was going to have to push back on those proposals. So it certainly doesn't seem to have been the understanding of your permanent secretary that that policy just simply didn't uh, apply at all. Can you help us with that? So, so I, I don't know when she's referring to, so it's difficult for me to answer that question. All I can say to you is I have a very high regard for Melanie, and if she had concluded that she needed to push back and she'd come to talk to me about it, I would have been very happy to join in a pushing back. I mean, when you're a minister, you have to publicly uh, respect um, what's called collective responsibility. So the idea is... I can't, as housing minister, go and give an interview saying, well, I don't really agree with what the health department is doing here. You have to back all government policy. But if Melanie had talked to me privately, my view was that these sort of one in, one out or one in, two out policies were slightly blunt instruments. I could understand what they were trying to achieve in terms of, uh, in terms of deregulation, but actually it's not really about the number of regulations there are. It's about what is the cost that a regulation is imposing and what is the benefit that it's bringing and looking at that cost-benefit analysis. That's what should really, in my opinion, drive decision-making on whether a particular regulation is still serving a, a good purpose or not. So if, if Melanie had come to me and said what, she's, what you just quoted her as saying, I would have been very happy joining her at a political level in pushing back. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you'd been told at the time, by the way, officials within this department feel that they're working in a policy environment where regulatory intervention is a last resort, what would you have said? I don't think I, uh, some of the other quotes you have read out to me worry me more than that quote. I mean, I don't think the government should regulate unless it needs to regulate. I suppose what I would have said if someone had said that exact phrase to me is, well, I agree that we shouldn't regulate unless we have to, but please don't, if that's, please don't let that make you feel that you can't come to me if you think there's something where we need to act. Right, okay, thank you. Um, I want to turn now to consider the Deputy Coroner's recommendations following the Lackanal House inquest and your knowledge and understanding of the work the department was doing in, re in relation to that. Um, now, we've touched on it before, but um, when did you first learn about the Lacanal House fire in any detail? You've mentioned the Steve Quartermain conversation, we'll come back to that, but did you ever get any detailed understanding of what the Lacanal House fire involved, or indeed what the coroner had recommended following it? No, um, and obviously, in preparing for this inquiry, I've now read 
uh, the, the coroner's letter and I've read Eric Pickles's response to it. And had I been shown those, um, which I never was, I think I probably would have asked for them. I probably should have asked for them myself anyway, but I would have asked for them at the point at which, post the discussion document, we had started doing the actual work. I think that would have raised some concerns about what exactly it was that the department had committed itself to. So does it follow that you weren't ever given any details about uh, the potential causes and factors that contributed to that fire? No. Did you even know that uh, it was, at least in part, an external cladding fire? No. You tell us in your witness statement that you weren't aware, this is paragraph 34, page 13 of your first statement, that you weren't aware of any other major uh, external fire spread incidents, such as uh, fires in the UAE. Is that correct? That you weren't aware of any of those? I can't see the witness statement, but, but that is correct, yes. So you hadn't heard of any fires in the Middle East between 2012 and 2015 when you took office? No. A fire in, in, in France, in Roubaix, in May 2012? No. You hadn't heard of that? Or the fire at the La Crosse building in Melbourne, Australia, in November 2014? You hadn't heard of that either? Just to, to be absolutely clear, I hadn't, I hadn't awareness of any other major external fires of this kind wherever no. in the world they took place. What about in this country? Were you made aware at any stage of the <coughs> 1999 fire at Garnet Court in Irvine in Scotland, which was a 17-storey block of facts and resulted in a select committee inquiry and recommendations being made? Was that ever drawn to your attention? Uh, I'm almost certain the answer to that is no. The inquiries obviously had copies of all of the briefing documents that came to me. I don't think there's any reference to it in any of them. No. Now, going back to the Lackanoff House fire, if we go to paragraph 11 of your first statement on page four. Yes. You, you say this, you say, um, I became aware of the Rule 43 letter, which I would have understood as a coroner's report and the outstanding recommendation to revise the approved document by way of an oral briefing from officials in autumn 2016. I cannot recall exactly how I became aware of it. This may have been at the introductory briefing with Bob Ledsom or when I was briefed prior to answering an oral question in the House of Commons about building regulations on the 24th of October 2016. My recollection is that it was Steve Quatermain who initially raised this with me. Now, in his witness statement to the inquiry, Steve Quatermain tells us that he was himself unaware of the coroner's Rule 43 letter until what he terms the, the autumn of 2016, when Bob Ledsom raised this with him as part of a one-to-one -one discussion. Now, for the transcript, that's at CLG 3030866, page 5, paragraph 17. Now, um, do you accept that given Mr Quatermain himself was not aware of these recommendations until the autumn of 2016. It's unlikely that you were made aware of it until that time. If, if my recollection that it was him that told me is correct, yes, self-evidently. Mm. Um, and it's not, I mean, from, from what I know now, having prepared for this appearance, it's not just Steve, it's the permanent secretary, Helen McNamara, the director general, the secretary of state, all of them in their witness statements so that they were never aware of this. Yes, now you told us earlier that it was at the end of a meeting, you remember Mr Quatermain taking you aside and mentioning the Lacknell House fire and the coroner's recommendations to you, is that right? Yes, I think the, 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 what we've got on screen at the moment is my first witness statement. I think I clarify it in my second witness statement. Yes. In my first one here I'm saying I can't remember which of the two occasions it was. And then I think the department shared some extra evidence with me, which led me to strongly believe it was, it was the latter of the two occasions. Exactly. You think it's certainly by the time you had the briefing in October 2016 that you'd learnt about those yes, matters? I think it was the 18th of October. Yes. Now, regardless of when it was, thinking back to that conversation with Steve Quatermain, did you say to him, hang on, I've been in post for several weeks or months, whatever it was at that point. Um, I've been in post for some time now. Why wasn't this part of an initial briefing that I got? Why am I only being told now about this important matter? Did you say that to him? I, I didn't, and I probably should have. Um, the context is probably 
helpful, uh, which is that the meeting had broken up. It was the end of the briefing, and he was literally catching me before the next uh, deputation was coming in for the next meeting. So he was basically saying to me, look, we, we talked about how to answer this. I think it was the Labour MP, Steve McCabe, was asking me a question about the building regulations. And it actually turned out to be a question about his private member's bill when we, when we got to it. But we thought it was going to be about the building regulations. And Steve just caught me at the end of the meeting and said, look, I want you to understand this. There's a thing, there's, a, there's, there's coroner's report. There were four recommendations. We've done three of them, but there's one outstanding. And if you get asked about it, the answer is we're going to deal with it as part of the wider review of building regulations. Now, obviously, I knew about that wider review of builder regulations. Um, so probably I should have done what you were suggesting to me, but I didn't. The next meeting was about to start, and I was really thinking more about being ready for the, for the question time and making sure I had the relevant information. Yes, so can you help us understand why at that point you didn't say to him, hang on, I want a briefing about this. This is obviously a major fire. There's been recommendations. This is the first I've heard of it orally. I want some paperwork on this so I can understand what's happened, what was recommended, where we are in dealing with these recommendations. Help us understand why you don't ask for that when he mentions this to you as an aside. So... Again, just at the, at the risk of repetition, I should have done so, clearly, is the first thing to say. Secondly, I've tried to give you the context. It was literally at the end of a meeting that was breaking up, but that doesn't excuse why I didn't come back at a subsequent moment and say to Steve, actually, can we have a conversation about that? Um, I think all I can say to you by way of mitigation is the impression he gave me was there were three kind of serious issues that we've dealt with. This was a more minor thing. It's just simplifying the document. We've got it on hand. And I just accepted that on trust, which I clearly shouldn't have done. Yes. Did Mr Quartermain tell you that he had only recently been told about it? Sorry, I'm answering too quickly. No, he didn't. Did it ring any alarm bells for you whatsoever that this hadn't been mentioned to you earlier or more formally? I'd like to say yes, but clearly it didn't, because if it had rung an alarm bell, I would have done what you were suggesting I should have done. When you were told about it, did you recollect, because you tell us you were generally aware of the fire, did you recollect that that fire had occurred quite a few years before this point. It, it occurred, in fact, in 2009. Was that something you remember being aware of, simply the passage of time since that fire? No, not at the time, because as I think I said to you when you asked me the question earlier on, when Steve referred to it, he referred to it by the name of the building, Lacanal, and I didn't link it with the thing right. that I knew had sort of heard about in the news before I was ever an MP. Um, so I didn't make that connection, no. Now, let's look at this briefing document that you were sent in October 2016. It appears at CLG 1308654. Here it is. It's in relation to oral questions tabled questions by Stephen McCabe, MP. You see that at the top? Yes. And you're the minister answering, the Minister of State for Housing, Planning, <coughs> and the Minister for London. Um, and then if we go within it to page uh, three, here we have uh, the briefing. Now, just for context, you tell us in your second statement, this is page four, paragraph 10, that you were sent this briefing initially on the 18th of October, 2016, and then it was redrafted and resent to you again on the 20th of October, 2016, in preparation for answering these oral questions in the House of Commons, yes? Yes. And this is the final, the redrafted version. Um, and under the heading fire safety, in the middle of that page, we can see it says this. It says, bullet one, the current fire safety provisions in part B, fire safety of the building regulations for England were published in 2006 with minor amendments in 2007, 2010 and 2013. And then it goes on. In 2013, the inquiry into the six deaths in the fire at Lacanal House recommended that guidance in approved document B should be simplified. Eric Pickles said at the time that government would review part B during this parliament and that this would include simplification where this was possible. Do you see that? I do. 
Now, just starting with that first bullet point, do you remember noticing at the time that the last major review of Part B, the fire safety provisions of the approved document, had been in 2006? Did that strike you uh, at all when you read this? I, I, I certainly don't remember that striking me, and I doubt that it did. So you didn't think to yourself, well, wow, that's 10 years ago, and there have only been minor amendments since then. That, that wasn't a thought that occurred to you? No. Did you... Um, I mean, to be, to be fair, the regulations themselves, for the, ver for the reason that you alluded to right at the start of your questioning because they're functional requirements, the actual building regs are relatively short in yes. Part B. So yes. I'm not sure if it is that surprising that they're not being updated regularly. It's, it's more the approved documents that you would expect to have more regular revision, <laughs> I would suggest. But it didn't anyway. Your, your question was, did it strike me? No, it didn't. Yes, I mean, in fact, that's, that's slightly misleading, that bullet point, because it was the approved document that had been updated and published in 2006 with minor amendments in 2007, 2010 and 2013, not the building regulations. But in fairness to you, I think what you're saying is you, you wouldn't have appreciated that at no, the time. No, I do know that now. Yes. Because I, um, I think there was just one change to the building regulations in terms of sprinklers at some point. But at the time, I would have just taken that for what it said literally on the, on the page. Yeah. Now, when you saw this briefing document, did you question immediately why you weren't told about the lacanal recommendations in your introductory briefing with Bod Leadsom in August 2016? No, I didn't. And why not? I don't know the answer to that. Um, I think probably the wording of this, I mean, it, it's worth recording. I'm sure everybody in the inquiry knows this, but that underlined... Uh, statement is critically wrong in terms of the timing of the commitment. Um, so if it had said what Eric Pickles actually promised, which was that this would be done by 2016, 2017, i.e., in my mind, I would have read that as March 2017, it would have provoked a very different reaction for me. Right. Because I would have thought, well, hang on a second... That's six months away. If we, if we literally do it on the last possible day, we've only got six months to do this and we'll have to consult on it, so we should be doing it right now. Why aren't I seeing this right now? But because it said during this parliament, which gives me the impression that we've got four and a bit years to do it, that both doesn't suggest a time pressure to do it immediately. And it also, I suspect, I don't know this, I suspect it made me think this isn't a sort of life safety critical issue, because if it was a life safety critical issue, we wouldn't be waiting four or so years potentially to do it. Right. So I, I, it's difficult. This is obviously looking back on something I read on a particular day in the office six years ago nearly now. Yes. So I can't say to you exactly how I felt, but my suspicion would be that that point, that inaccuracy on the timetable of when we had to do this by made a big difference to how I reacted to it. Right. I mean, we can see it's Eric Pickles' commitment, so it's the previous Secretary of State's commitment, and it talks about during this parliament. What did you understand that to mean? During the parliament that was running when Eric Pickles was the no, Secretary of State? because that would be the former parliament. This, this parliament I would have taken as the 2015, expecting it to run to 2020 parliament. Right. So I would have taken that as saying, I know, I know these things are very, these dates are very opaque. So the Pickles commitment, 2016, 17, I've seen previous evidence where people are interpreted that in different ways. To me, to anyone in politics, 2016 7, slash 17 means financial year 2016, 17. So it means you have to do that by March, 2017. Yes. And if you say during the, this parliament, it means the parliament I'm in when I'm reading this document, which is the parliament that began with the 2015 election and that is going to potentially run for five years to 2020. Yes, but did you ask yourself the question, why would Eric Pickles be making a commitment that the review would be completed during the next parliament? That often happens. I didn't ask myself that question at all. And quite often people will make commitments that are reasonably long in the future. So that wouldn't have struck me doesn't strike me today as a surprising thing. Really? No. Not, not odd that in 2013, uh, I mean, you can see what the, the commitment is here, or at least you can see what it's being represented as, should be simplified. 
did, did the, the simple passage of time since 2013 not strike you as odd? That why would Eric Pickles be taking not only the time in his own parliament, but the next one to deliver a simplification of a document like the approved document B? Did, I'm, did I'm that afraid, not occur to you? I'm afraid it didn't. And I, and I don't think that, uh, even looking back at it now, whereas some of the things you've asked me about, looking back on it now, I think I should have done X or Y. I still don't feel that looking at that now. Quite often in politics, people make commitments that are a long time in the future. And if, if I'd thought about it, I probably would have thought there was an agreed timetable of updating the different documents, and he promised to do this within that timescale because that was the timetable they were doing it on. So it's one sentence. I'm answering six questions. Each briefing document is probably about 10 pages long. It's one sentence on one of those pages. I've read it and taken it at its word. And I, I, I follow that, and I, I understand that, but you're being told that six people have died in this fire... Isn't that something that might suggest at least a common sense level that this might be time critical to address this when you've had a fire like that that's actually resulted in that number of fatalities? So, so if, if, if it was simply in that context alone, maybe. But obviously I've had the conversation with Steve Quartermain where he's told me that there were four recommendations, three of them were serious and have been dealt with, and this one is not time critical and is going to be wrapped into a wider review. So it's in the context of that conversation. I expect, I, because this is the final version of the note, my memory is I've had the conversation with Steve Quartermain before I've read this briefing note. Yes, I see. Now, at this point, you're being told about the Lacknell House fire. You're being told about recommendations. Um, did you ask to see the Rule 43 letter, the coroner's recommendations letter, so that you could see for yourself what those recommendations had been? I didn't, know. Again, I wish that I had done so, but I, I have accepted Steve's advice about what the situation was. If I'd read the letters, I would have had a very different reaction because having now read Eric Pickles' response to the coroner, I think there's a lack of clarity about exactly what the government was committing itself to. Yes. Can we agree now that you really ought to have immediately asked to see at least the coroner's letter and the letter from the department in response so that you had, when you were answering questions in Parliament on these matters, so that you had a very clear understanding of exactly what the background was to this? Um, yes, but probably not for the reason that you've given. Uh, I think when you're answering questions in Parliament, it's virtually impossible to read all of the source documents I've talked to you already about the volume of work. If you, if, you, if you didn't rely on the briefings telling you what the commitments that have been made are and said, I must read the original letter that Eric Pickles has written, you would quickly be drowning. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I'm still going to accept the basic premise of your question because I think I should have, not immediately necessarily, but I should have, as I said to you earlier, <coughs> said, actually, Steve, can we go back through this and can I understand it? So I accept the premise of your question. Okay. I'm not sure if it was necessary to do it to answer the question in Parliament, but more to understand what exactly Eric Pickles had said. Okay. Did you ever see that Rule 43 letter uh, by the coroner <coughs> when, when you were housing minister? No, or the response. So even when you were looking at more detailed submissions... Uh, about, for example, the discussion document, you never thought to ask to see, well, what, what's generated all of this? What's the background? And, and in particular, the background to this very fatal fire? No. Uh, so the discussion document, the March iteration, obviously the, the September iteration of the discussion document has come before I'm even aware of it. The March iteration of the discussion document does reference it, the, the, the covering submission. So I was satisfied that we were progressing the issue in the discussion document. The point, I think, at which I would have looked at the letter and the response, as I alluded to you earlier, was when we had the responses to the discussion document and we decided what are we going to do in relation to approved document B. That certainly would have been a point where I wanted to check back precisely, but I don't think that was necessary for the discussion document. What I needed to assure myself of for the discussion document was that it was covering the issue that I had found out about, and it was in the March iteration. Did obviously, you... I mean, just for the record, obviously that discussion document never gets published because the general election is called... Yes. ..the day after I approve it. 
We know that. Yes, and we'll, we'll come to that. You tell us in your statement that you, as well as receiving this written briefing, you had an oral pre-briefing uh, at around the same time. Uh, did you raise any of those matters, you know, the background to Lacanol, what were the coroner's recommendations? Did you ask about any of those things in that oral briefing? No. And again, I'm, I'm making, I think I make this clear in my second witness statement, I'm making assumptions here. I think what we have on the screen at the moment is the final version of the briefing document. Yes. So either this sentence wasn't in the original version or I hadn't picked it up because it is after the, the briefing meeting that I have the conversation with Steve Quartermain. So that's the point where I'm first aware of it and then I read this sentence in the briefing document after. Now I can't say for certainty to you and I don't think that you have the original draft to check whether I either just didn't pick it up when I read the skim read it before the briefing meeting or whether it wasn't there in the original draft and was then added subsequent to the conversation Steve Quartermain and yes. I had. Now if, if we could just look at page five of this briefing document yes and the penultimate paragraph um, you can see this is what you referred to earlier that what the what your officials do is try and anticipate some of the questions you might get on the back of this and then give you draft answers. And we've got in the penultimate uh, question, when will you start the review of part B? So that's part B on fire safety. And the answer is we are considering the terms of reference for that review and will announce these in due course. Uh, again, <coughs> did it not strike you as odd that the Lackanell House fire had clearly occurred some years before and you're told that the recommendations were made in 2013 and yet all that's happening at this point is that the department is considering terms of reference for the review. Did you pick that up? No, because I think how I would have read this sentence um, is that by this point um, we decided to wrap... Well, actually, we, hadn't, we were presented almost as a fait accompli that previous ministers had agreed that this would be dealt with by a wider review... Um, so I would have taken that sentence as referring not just to the specific issues in the coroner's letter, but the wider review that we were working on. There is, there is something which it may be helpful to draw to your attention at this point that I don't have the answer for. Um, are you going to come on to the September submission? Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll come on to that. Oh, the submission... In terms of the original submission? Yes, the for the discussion document. document. Yes, Just very briefly, I don't want to spend too much time on it if you're going to come on to it, but that submission envisages publication of the discussion document after conference, after party conference, i.e., I would guess, late October, early November. By this point, that timetable has gone. Yes. And the timetable is after the housing white paper. So at some point we have decided that we're not going to try and do that discussion document until we've got the white paper done. And I remember those discussions. <clears throat> One of the curious things is, in the document pile that's been released to you and to me, there's never a submission where we formally take that decision. So I can't tell you quite when that decision was taken, but the September submission is clearly saying the discussion document is coming after the conference. By the time of this oral questions, we've clearly will announce the timing in due course. We've clearly decided it, the housing white paper comes first and then that's coming. But I can't actually identify for you when was the moment that decision was taken because it's not in the document record. Right, I, okay. I just thought it was helpful to point that out to you. Yes. And to the inquiry. Now, if we just look at um, paragraph 12 of your first witness statement on page four. Yes. You give us um, some more detail about what you were aware of by this point. And, and you say at paragraph 12, my understanding of the position, as explained to me, was that there had been a fire at Lackanell House and that the coroner had made a number of recommendations in response. I understood that three of the four recommendations had been progressed by Eric Pickles, but one was outstanding. My understanding was that the outstanding issue related to part B of the building regulations. And then before I ask you questions, I want you to also look at what you say at paragraph 11 of your second statement on page 5. You say here, on the same topic, 
it was my categoric understanding that three out of the four recommendations had been addressed during Eric Pickles' time as Secretary of State. I understood the three recommendations that had been addressed were the most urgent and that the one outstanding matter related to the clarity of the approved document, which I was told needed simplifying. Now, first of all, how were you led to believe that the three recommendations that had been addressed were the most urgent? And just to help you, the other three were firefighting and search and rescue matters, fire risk assessment, and the retrofit of sprinklers. How were you led to believe that those were the most urgent? Um, so I think I've answered that already. That, that was the impression I was given by Steve Quartermain when we spoke. Right. And were you positively led to believe by Mr Quartermain that the outstanding matter in relation to ADB was the least urgent? Did he say that? I'm not sure if he used the word least, but he implied that that was not an urgent issue. It was about simplification. And hence, clearly, if it had been an urgent issue, you would not have wrapped it into the discussion document, uh, which covered not just Part B, but other bits of the building regulations, and which it was very clear from the September submission was going to take a year or two to, to run through the process in terms of delivering. So yeah. clearly it was implicit in that decision that this was not urgent. But I'm not sure, since you, since you used a specific phrase, I'm not sure if you used the phrase least urgent. No, OK. Did you understand that it was urgent at all? this, this no, I remaining recommendation? I didn't think it was urgent, as I said, because otherwise you wouldn't have wrapped it into the wider review, because that would mean that you were not going to deliver it in quick time. Right. Now, um, were you satisfied that simplifying the approved document was the extent of the remaining recommendation? So at the time, yes, because that's what I was told. And as we've, as we've discussed about 10, 15 minutes ago, I didn't get for myself the coroner's letter and Eric Pickles' response. Even now, having read the coroner's letter, I think it's not entirely clear. I don't know if it's possible to put the coroner's letter on the screen. I'm coming to it in just a moment. So there, are, um, there are three things, if I try and do it from memory then. Don't, don't, don't well, do that. Better to wait for counsel to ask. Exactly. We don't need to do it from memory. <coughs> um, what I'm interested in it is you, in this particular paragraph, you say in the penultimate three lines, the one outstanding matter related to the clarity of the approved document, which I was told needed simplifying. Now, did you understand clarity and simplification to be synonymous with one another? Yes, and I broadly still do. So this is why it's difficult to answer this question without reference to the, the letter. My memory is that there are three bits of what the coroner says from having now read it subsequently. One was about the clarity of a specific section. One was about putting the whole thing into language that was intelligible to the ordinary person rather than a specialist. The last bit, I think, is not about clarity. It is about is more substantive, which it is saying that the approved document needs to deal not just with new buildings, but with the with the refurbishment and retrofit of an existing building. Yeah. So, but I still think if I read the coroner's letter now, I would assume points one and two about clarity and simplification are basically linguistic rather than substantive, if I can put it that way. That's now, I may be wrong, but that's how I would have read her letter. Sure. But that, that's you reading the, uh, the letter many years after the event. Yes. And you didn't well, see it at the before. time, all I was told was simplification. Yeah. Now, having read the letter, the third thing the coroner asked for is definitely not simplification. The first thing is arguable, I think. Mm. It's not clear to my mind. Did you ever ask yourself this question? Why is it that simplification is all that's needed following the deaths of six people in this fire? Didn't that, that stark fact strike you as a little odd that that's all she would want is a simplification of a document if six people have died? If, if that had literally been the only recommendation, yes, that would have struck me as odd. But I've been told that there were three other recommendations which were more serious and about life safety that had been dealt with. So that thought didn't strike me for that reason. But if, in a hypothetical where it was just simplification, yes, that is how I would have reacted. Let's look briefly then at the, the Rule 43 letter. And, and what I'm, I'm trying to get at most is what you had been told at the time and understood at the time, rather than how you, after the event, are rationalising that letter. Yeah. Um, so it's at CLG 40s 
And so this is the letter to uh, the Right Honourable Eric Pickles, dated the 28th of March 2013. And the parts we are concerned with appear on page three. And we can see uh, under the heading Building Regulations and Approved Document B, she says, during these inquests, we examined Approved Document B. Um, and then she gives the addition that she looked at. I'm aware that ADB has subsequently been amended and believe that a further amendment is due to be published soon. The introduction to ADB states that it is intended to provide guidance for some of the more common building situations. However, ADB is a most difficult document to use. Further, it is necessary to refer to additional documents in order to find an answer to relatively straightforward questions concerning the fire protection properties of materials to be incorporated into the fabric of a building. And she makes those three recommendations. The first is uh, provides clear guidance in relation to Regulation B4 of the building regulations with particular regard to the spread of fire over the external envelope of the building and the circumstances in which attention should be paid to whether proposed work might reduce existing fire protection. Yes? Yes. And then there's a second recommendation, is expressed in words and adopts a format which are intelligible to the wide range of people and bodies again engaged in construction, maintenance and refurbishment of buildings, and not just to professionals who may already have a depth of knowledge of building regulations and building control matters. And then finally, provides guidance which is, is of assistance to those involved in maintenance or refurbishment of older housing stock, and not only those engaged in design and construction of new buildings. Buildings. Now, um, just take this in stages. Were you ever told that in relation to this last recommendation that you understood to be outstanding, there were in fact multiple recommendations that lay beneath that no. that the coroner had made? No. And can we agree that this Rule 43 letter refers specifically to the need to provide clear guidance relating to external fire spread? Yes? We can, but that phrase... To my mind, you're asking me mainly about what I knew at the time. Mm -hmm. But even now, looking at this letter, to me it is unclear whether that is saying there is guidance at the moment but it isn't clear or there isn't guidance on these important matters in the approved document right now. Yes, but either way, that would be a lack of clarity of the guidance. Either the guidance isn't clear or the guidance has omissions. Yes, yes? but they are, those are important distinctions because if the issue was a lack of clarity in the guidance, then to me, as I, as I tried to say uh, a couple of minutes ago, ball points one and two are basically about, are basically linguistic. They are about whether the approved document is expressed in a way that makes it easy to use, both in terms of its general language and specifically about uh, regulation B4. But I would agree with you that the third issue is undeniably not about simplification. Yeah. Well, can you agree that the officials who were advising relevant ministers at this time would have presumably gone back to the lacunal transcripts and the concerns that were being raised by the coroner at the time and read this letter in its proper context so as to understand exactly what she was getting at? I, I would hope so, but I, I obviously don't know the answer to that question. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just telling you, I'm trying to be helpful and tell you what my reaction... If I had done what I should have done and got hold of this letter and read it, I would have been clear that this was about more than simplification, yes. but I would have been a bit unclear about what that first bullet point was asking for. Yes. Now, maybe you're suggesting to me that if you'd got transcripts of the coroner's, it might have, there might have been ways of getting clarity. Well, but did you know that one of uh, your officials in, in the department, Mr Martin, had actually given <coughs> oral evidence at the inquest? Were you ever made aware of that? No. Were you ever made aware that the Rule 43 letter, I know you didn't see it, but did anyone ever say to you, by the way, it in fact makes no mention of simplification at all? Were you ever told that? No, um, but I'm a bit nervous of placing too much weight on that because simplification is my memory of the word that was used to me. I can't, I couldn't say to you absolutely certain that's the exact word that was used. I think it was, and I think other people have given evidence that also used that phrase, but... Did you ever come to appreciate that there was no proper record keeping relating to the lateral inquest on the department's part? Well, I, I have come to appreciate it subsequently, listening to the considerations of this inquiry, but at the time, if that's what you're asking me, no. No. 
Did you know, for example, there was no proper record of which recommendations had been accepted, which rejected, and precisely what work the department had committed to do? Did you know? I, I, at the time, I didn't. Uh, I think I made the point in answer to an earlier question that when I read the Secretary of State's response, I think it is very unclear what it is committing the government to doing. Hmm. Did and you know? Normally, oh, sorry. So I'm apologies for interrupting you. Normally, when the government responds, say to a select committee report or or to some other series of recommendation that has been put to government, the response will say recommendation accepted, recommendation rejected, or recommendation hmm. partially accepted, and then lay out the rationale for why the government has come to the conclusion hmm. uh, it's come to. Um, so. I didn't know that at the time, but certainly having read the letter, that is my impression. Yes. Did you know more generally that the department had no protocol or system in place for how to record and track coroner's recommendations and in order to ensure that the work was carried out to deliver on any commitments that had been made in relation to those? No, I didn't. Um, but I'm not sure as, as ministers you would necessarily get insight into the internal systems of the department in that way. I mean, it's not just... Obviously, a coroner's recommendation is vitally important because it, it impacts on life safety. But more generally, the department will, may, will have made a whole series of commitments to, to parliament or maybe internally within the government, and there clearly needs to be some mechanism for tracking progress on all of those. And whose responsibility ought that to have been? So I, I, I would hesitate to name an individual, but there'll be some, there should be someone in the sort of corporate affairs, if you like, section of the department that is, that is the central bit of the department that is monitoring that. Now, we touched on it earlier, but it, let's look at it in your uh, witness statement about the clear steer you'd been given by the Prime Minister about the key priority or your key priority during your tenure as Housing Minister. If we could look at paragraph 13 on page 4 of your first statement. Yes, I can see that. In the third sentence... You say, uh, picking up in the middle of the line, given the clear steer I had been given by the Prime Minister that the key priority was addressing the housing supply crisis, I accepted the advice I was given that the, the outstanding issue would be dealt with as part of a broader review of building regulations as soon as the housing white paper was published. Do you see that? And you, you clarify, we don't need to go to it, in your second witness statement, this is page 7, paragraph 18, that you were given that steer in a phone call that you received from the Prime Minister on the 17th of July 2016. Now, help us with this. Why uh, was the priority the housing supply crisis such that other things, like this review of the building regulations, simply had to wait? Why was that? <clears throat> um, it's just before I directly answer your question, uh, just as you draw my attention to the sentence now, it's probably worth saying that this should probably say we accepted because this would have been a collective decision of the Secretary of State and myself. Um, the submission on the discussion document in September had come to both of us uh, and certainly the decision of the timing of the white paper and the discussion document would not have been one for me to take on my own. So it would have been a collective, I see, a collective just, decision. It's just helpful well, to say that. Just explain to us whether it was your decision or a collective one, why was it decided to prioritise the housing white paper and not be progressing this building regulations review work in parallel? My memory was that the department simply didn't have the capacity to do both of those things at the same time. The housing white paper was an enormous, I mean, was an enormous piece of work the department had reduced quite a bit in terms of its headcount um, during the preceding few years. And I think the combination of those two things meant that there wasn't the capacity, probably at ministerial level, but certainly at official level, to try and do both of those things at the same time. Now, one of the, one of the things that I think is important to point out here is that the delay was longer than anticipated because at the point at which we took the decision, our expectation was that the white paper would be published in November. Because it grew in scope and because it proved so difficult to get collective agreement to it, it ended up not being published until January. So the delay that we felt that we were imposing when we took this decision turned out to be a longer delay than we had anticipated. Was it your understanding that the Building Regulations Division, Mr Ledson, Mr Harrell and Mr Martin, would be working on that housing white paper and therefore couldn't 
uh, carry on work on this uh, building regulation review at the same time. So they made some contribution to the white paper and you also would have wanted Steve Quartermain and Helen McNamara who who had overall responsibility above Bob and his team to make some contribution to the discussion document. So it, it's, it was a problem, I guess, both ways. Did anyone ask themselves the question, well, is producing the housing white paper uh, more important to government than ensuring the building regulations and approved document beyond fire safety were fit for purpose? So, so they didn't ask that question. Um, and I think probably, despite the fact you've asked it, you understand the reason why not, which is that the department had convinced itself that this wasn't a safety a life safety issue uh, and that wasn't therefore urgent <clears throat> had it had it properly understood what it what was required in the coroner's report i'm sure that question would have been asked but it wasn't for the reasons that i think are, are already evident from what i've from what i've said i see so is is it fair to say that because it wasn't flagged clearly to you that this was a life urgent life safety issue um you never questioned whether or not this work ought to be parked behind the housing white paper. So, th so that would be fair, but it would only be a partial account of the problem. It's not just me, it's the Secretary of State, it's the Permanent Secretary of the Department, it's the Director General for Housing and Planning. None of those people, by their own witness statements that they've submitted to the inquiry, understood, and I think that the Department's own opening statement is very honest about this, that the Department had lost sight of the urgency of this issue. Mm. Uh, and therefore, it wasn't just uh, a decision that I personally took, although I'm, I'm perfectly prepared to shoulder my share of the responsibility, but the Secretary of State and the officials that were making the recommendation to us were doing so on a false premise about how time critical the, the work on building regulations was. Right, I see. Now, one of the pieces of work which we know we now know was going to feed into the review of approved document B on fire safety was some research by the BRE, the British Research Establishment, which was commissioned by the department in 2012, so in fact before the coroner's recommendations in 2013, uh, and um, it was entitled Compartment <coughs> Sizes, Resistance to Fire and Fire Safety Project, and it's been referred to colloquially as the, the seven work streams, yes? Now, you can take it from me that that research was delivered to the department in March 2015. So it was in the department's hands by March 15. And permission was initially sought to publish it on the 14th of December 2015 in a ministerial submission to James Wharton. Yes, so that had all happened before. You just your... repeat those dates, it's in March 2015. So it was in the department's hands in March 2015. And a submission to publish it was initially sought... Um, on the 14th of December 2015 from James Wharton. Now, do you recall ever being made aware of, of this research, these seven work streams reports and this BRE research? I don't think so. Are these, are these some of the reports that I eventually gave agreement to be published? Well, let's, let me carry on with my questions. Um, I, I'm interested to know whether you were ever aware of these BRE research reports. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm not trying to be difficult here. I don't, I don't know how to answer your question. I know that I gave approval for some pieces of research work to be published because it was a policy of the department that whenever it commissioned research, it was important that that research was put into the public domain. But I, I don't recognise the terminology you're using, so I'm not sure if the ones I approved are the ones you're talking about. Well, let's, let's keep going. Um, well, do you want to try and approach it from a different, slightly different yes. direction? Yes. Well, uh, let me do, go to some documents. <coughs> the documents show us that chases to special advisers, to ministers, to publish this research were made in March, May, July, August, October, November, December 2016. And chases were sent in January and March 2017. That's what the documents show. Now, let's turn to an email exchange. This is CLG 301. So could, could you just give me those dates again? Yes. So March, May, July, August, October, November, December 2016, and in January and March 2017. Okay. Can we look at an email exchange? This is CLG 3019376. 
This is an email exchange between Bob Ledsom and your uh, private sec assistant private secretary, Ed Neve, is that right? Yes, Ed was one of my private secretaries. On the 13th of October 2016. Now, I want to pick this up at the bottom of page two. And um, the subject matter of these emails is things stuck in private office, yes? And we can see there's an email from Ed Neve to Bob Ledsom, dated the 13th of October 2016 at 14.24, at the bottom of that page. And it states, it says, Hi, Bob, we are looking to compile a list of things that have been stuck in private office for more than a month. I'd be grateful if you could put a list together, particularly of those technical reports that are awaiting publication, as well as any other subs that you're awaiting feedback on. If you could send through a list today, that would be really helpful. Thanks! Exclamation mark. And then if we go up the email chain, um, 354, 1554, Bob Ledsom says, it, it so happens that we have assembled a cross-planning directorate list of outstanding subs and publications, which I think Simon plans to talk through with the minister at their next catch-up, <coughs> Bob. And then Ed Neve then uh, responds to that, um, saying, thanks, Bob, this is at 1552. Would you mind just letting us know which ones are with SPADs in the meantime? We may have an opportunity to go through things if you could send through today. And then if we then go to the top email in the chain, timed at 1621, we can see that Mr. Ledson responds and he says there are two sets of publications and item one is uh, unpublished historical building regulations research report, first attachment. Do you see that? Sorry, just say again. So item one that's underlined. Yes. Unpublished yes. historical building regulations research report, first attachment. Title of submission underneath that in the bullet. Agreement to publish a number of historical research reports, submission and annex. Attached copies of the sub and the additional information requested by SPADS in May. Details of recipient, minister or SPADS, both. James Wharton and Mark Francois were the original ministers who saw this. Date sent 14th of December 2015, originally, been resubmitted several times. These are all reports dating back to projects commissioned under the coalition government, in line with a commitment in a PQ of summer 2015 to publish them all by the end of the year. The original submission and reports went up last December. Eventually, we had agreement from previous SPADs that they could be published immediately after the referendum. Reference to the reports appears in the building regulations discussion document that we're looking in to publish in November. This is because they are one of the main source materials for some of the key areas on which we will be seeking views. For example, sound insulation, part B, or fire safety, part B. Do you see that? I do see it, yeah. And then if we look at the first attachment that he attached to this email, at CLG 30019315, we can see the original email from the 14th of December 2015 attaching the submission to James Wharton. And we can see at the bottom of page one, it's spelt out in this attachment email what these reports relate to. Yep. And you can see at the bottom, penultimate point C, fire compartment sizes, a review of technical, specific technical issues in the statutory guidance on fire safety, approved document B, then D, investigation of real fires, report of lessons learnt from significant fires to feed into statutory guidance on fire safety, approved document B. And then over the page E, the fire safety procedural guide, update of user guide on fire safety legislation. Now, just going back a page, we know from other documents that item C was the seven work streams reports. Now, were you ever made aware of this email exchange at the time that Bob Ledson was corresponding with your assistant private secretary over things stuck in private office? Before I answer your question, could you go back to the original document that you had up on screen? When you say the original document... So this is the annex, isn't it? And you, you had a... You, you, yes, you CLG 3019376. Me... And can you scroll down a little bit? Yeah. So the, the difficulty I have is that every other document you've asked me questions about so far were in my pack and I had a chance to read and study them before. I've never seen this before. Right. So it's obviously harder for me to mm. be helpful to the inquiry. So I just want to understand, 
before I try and answer your questions, where these things were stuck. Because I know nothing, I don't think I know anything about this. Yes. Well, all we know is it says things stuck in private office. And they remained stuck and they were never published, are you suggesting? So um, these reports were published in February 2019. It's absurd. Um, so all, all, all I, let me say what I can to be as helpful as I can. Um, so first of all, if you're saying that the, the reports were given to the department in March 2015, and it took until 14th of December 2015 for a sub to come up to ministers, that's not good enough. Yeah. And if it took four years for them then to be released, that is absurd. Um, all I can say to you, uh, and I can only comment on the material that the de department has provided with me about my time as a minister, there were some research reports that came to me for approval, and I was a bit slow in approving them. I think from memory, a bit slow means four or five weeks. I remember, and I think Steve Quartermain refers to this in his written evidence that he's given to you, that he came and had a word with me and said, you've got some BRE research reports in that intray and I need, them, I need them cleared. And I dealt with them straight away when he spoke to me about it. And that kind of conversation between me and Steve, as I was alluding to on the planning earlier, was a fairly regular one. He helped me manage this huge intray I had by telling me these are the things that we need you to focus on first. So if where I thought you were going with this question was to say to me, these research reports came in and you sat on them for a while before you approved them, which, to which I would have to say, guilty as charged. But I know, I know nothing about these at all. I've never seen this email before. Um, and to the best of my knowledge, there were no reports that I didn't eventually clear when because Steve and I had these regular triage conversations. So I can only assume that the phrase stuck in private office does not refer solely to my private office and that they were stuck somewhere else in the system. But I'm sorry not to be able to give you a more helpful answer on such a critical question because it is clearly appalling that, input, that public money has been spent on pieces of research <coughs> that has sat in the department for four years without being published. Yes. I have no explanation as to how that's happened and I'm appalled by it. Okay. All we can say is that based on our reading of the documents, it does look like they were stuck in your private office and not anywhere else. But I don't see how that is possible because if that had been true, Steve Quartermain would have escalated to me. He did so on numerous other issues in relation to the planning casework uh, and to individual pieces of in individual policy submissions and indeed to a couple of specific submissions about clearing research reports. So, you know, I, I find it, I find that, all I can say to you is I find that incredible as an answer, okay. that it could have been stuck in my private. I, I certainly would accept if they'd been stuck for a number of weeks and it had taken me time to go, get to them, that is absolutely plausible that that happened. But the idea that they would have sat there <coughs> the whole time as my minister without Steve Quartermain coming to me and saying, this is unacceptable, Gavin, get those reports cleared, I find completely incredible. Ms. Grange, just help me with this um, and perhaps help uh, the witness as well. You can see at the top of what's on our screens, details of recipient are put down as James Wharton and Mark Francois. Yes. And um, I have a little bell ringing at the back of my mind that these reports... They were first sent to that minister. Exactly. They and were they first were then sent. held up in someone's private office, possibly because it was said they had to be cleared by SPADs who sat on them for quite a long time. Is, is that the position? That appears to be the position. But here we've got Mr Ledsom corresponding well, with Mr Barwell's assistant private secretary. That I understand. And they're yeah. now in his private office. Yes. But they had been part of the delay, if one looks from the, uh, over the whole picture... That's right. ...appears to have been there sitting in other private offices. Is that... But that's uh, correct. That's as, as we understand Could, could you go on to the second page of, of what we've got on the screen here? Yes, because those I, were, those I suspect were the, it may well be spads. So, bit, could, so those were the emails I showed you. If you go to the bottom yes. of page two. <clears throat> so I'm pretty sure that when Ed talks about things stuck in private office, he's not just talking about my office. And if we scroll up a little bit, was there a second Ed email? Yes, there's one at the top of this page, which I read to you. 
Um, because he's saying which ones are with spads in the meantime. So it clearly yeah. implies that Ed is thinking that some of these are not in my office. Right. Ms. Grange, um, I don't know whether we need to pursue this any further. I thought it right just for the, really for the witness's benefit to bring out the fact that we weren't saying they'd spent the whole of the time stuck in his private office. No, and that's why I, um, I explained that it was originally sent to James Wharton in December exactly. 2015. But if we do need to revert to this, should we do it after the... I was about to suggest that. But Mr Chair, I want to be clear. I, yeah. I, I'm grateful for your <laughs> clarification, but I, I just want to be very clear on the record. I can't prove it to you, but I do not believe that these things were stuck for that length of time in my private. I don't believe Steve would have allowed that to happen. He would have come and sat with me with the submissions yeah. and made sure I cleared them if they were in my office. All right, well, don't worry. We won't be making any damning <laughs> findings without checking out the material very thoroughly first. It's time we all had a break to get some lunch, so we'll stop there. We'll resume, please, at five past two. And as before, I have to ask you not to talk to anyone about your evidence or anything relating to it while you're out of the room. Understood. All right. Thank you very much. Would you like to give the usher, please? Thank you. Right, Ms. Grange, I'm sorry to interrupt your question, no, no, but it good. seemed to me that there yeah, was yes. a danger of putting a slightly false point to witness, okay. not your fault I, at all, I but it's just because of the way these documents read. Right, we'll break there and resume at five past two, please. Thank you. Thank you.